whoa, 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 whoa. Welcome, we will begin in about five minutes. Please know that closed captioning is available today.
Here's a big idea. The biggest ideas don't always start big. They begin as a tiny spark, only seen by those who know how to look, brought to life by a shared desire to change what's possible. From inventing the touchscreen technology that connects you to the world, to outfitting the astronauts who orbit around it, at the University of Delaware, ideas grow until they become bigger than big and challenge the way the world thinks. Because UD was built to create impact at every scale. From studying the nuances of how we move through our world to protecting the vast expanses of our ocean environments through graduates who are there to shape our country and leaders who continue to impact our world today. Through students driven by passion and values and friendships that start in Delaware and span the globe. We are inspired to stand together because that's what blue hens do. Together, we make connections on a human scale. Together, we pivot into bold new territory. Together, we give the smallest lives the biggest advantage because we know the size of an idea can only be measured by its impact. At the University of Delaware, the ideas bring us together and together, we make them giant. Hello, Blue Hens, and welcome to New Student Orientation. My name is Kelly Murray, and I serve as the Interim Director for Orientation and Transition Programs. And I am thrilled to have you all here today and excited for you to join the Blue Hen community this fall. To the students here, I hope that you consider today your first day as a Blue Hen. Take advantage of your time in your NSO sessions, ask questions, connect with your new classmates and the orientation leaders in your small group sessions, and learn more about what you can expect as a new UD student. To the parents and families with us today, I encourage you to also make the most of your sessions today. I know that your students transition to the University of Delaware is also a significant transition for you too. And I hope that after today you feel more informed and confident knowing that the University of Delaware is a university that will both challenge and support your student. Throughout today's session, staff and student leaders from orientation and transition programs will be available to assist with questions. And shortly you'll learn more about our team and today's schedule from our student coordinators, Sunit Abraham and Connor Holm. If you have questions throughout today's session, please feel free to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit them. In addition, closed captioning is also available today, and you can select that through the live transcript button to start seeing captions on your screen. It's now my pleasure to introduce a special message from UD's Vice President for Student Life, Dr. Jose Luis Riera. Dr. Riera has served in his role as Vice President since November 2018, and he's been in the Division of Student Life since 2010. Through his leadership as Vice President, Dr. Riera seeks to promote student success and facilitate learning, development, and career readiness for students within communities that value well being, social engagement, and inclusion. Hello, Blue Hens, and welcome to UD. My name is Jose Riera, and I have the privilege to serve as the Vice President for Student Life. I'm thrilled to welcome you as our newest Blue Hens. This is a momentous time in our university's history, and I am so glad that you have decided to join our community now. You were chosen from one of UD's largest applicant pools in history, and we cannot wait to see you on campus this fall. And let me welcome our newest Blue Hen families. We wanna answer all of your questions today and hopefully calm any anxieties you might have as well. UD continues to attract great talent. We chose you because we believe you'll do great things here. And most importantly, we are confident that you have what it takes to be successful at UD. We understand that you're eager to find others with whom you can relate, understand more about your classes and academics, and affirm that this is the right place for you. We want those same things for you and are here to help you succeed in your goals. Today is about beginning to understand your new identity as a University of Delaware Blue Hen. But remember, today is not the end. It's just the beginning. 
you will have plenty of time to acclimate to this new place, and I encourage you to allow yourself the time and space you need to transition to college life. And I assure you, it will take time, and that's very normal. Our goal is to set you on a path that enables success within and beyond the classroom, and even now, to begin preparing you to thrive as a graduate of UD. As Vice President for Student Life, I've learned a lot about what it means to be a Blue Hen by interacting with and observing countless students throughout my time at UD. Here are three ways I've come to understand what it means to be a Blue Hen. First, Blue Hens learn to see familiar things with fresh eyes. Blue Hens are focused on and value learning. You'll have an opportunity to think critically about the influencers, music, movies, and books you know, as well as new ones you'll encounter. You'll examine what you know about your community, your social circles, even your own thoughts, beliefs, and opinions. You'll ask yourself why and how these things came to be. Whether your perspective is changed or confirmed, it's how we believe real growth happens. Second, Blue Hens try new things, go new places, meet new people, and embrace the full diversity of the world. While you're here, I hope you'll consider taking a few courses outside your major, getting involved in a cause, studying abroad, befriending those who are different than you, learning a new skill, maybe even starting a business. You never know that novel experience may be what leads you to your next steps after leaving UD. As you meet new people and encounter new cultural experiences, my hope for you is that you will be moved to commit to creating a more socially just society. You'll never have a better time in your life to explore for the sake of exploring. You never know what you'll discover, especially about yourself. Finally, blue hands serve others. We believe true education means being consequential in the world. That is using your learning to positively impact those around you. You'll have opportunities to serve right here in this community, maybe helping people with chronic illnesses, mentoring youth, or raising money for children with cancer. Or you can serve on the other side of the world, meeting the medical infrastructure housing needs of people. However you choose to serve others, we know that you will grow and that you will refine your passion and purpose that will ultimately drive your decisions post-graduation. During new student orientation and 1743 welcome days, we will introduce you to numerous opportunities available this coming semester that are designed to start you off on the path of success at UD. Take advantage of these to become known to your peers and to be engaged in our community. To support you, we offer a myriad of services and programs from mental health counseling, leadership development, career consulting, medical care, to academic advising and support. Avail yourself to these resources. They are here to help you achieve your goals. If you don't know how to connect with one, just ask. We will get you the answer. For now, students, please continue to connect with us through Canvas, and parents and families can connect with us through the Blue Hen Family Hub. We also welcome all to follow our social media channels so you can be informed on the latest UD news. Once again, welcome to your Blue Hen journey. As our newest Blue Hens, we hope you'll embrace everything that means. Enjoy your time today, and I'll see you again at 1743 Welcome Days. Hello. And good afternoon, Blue Hens. We're so excited to have you with us here today. My name is Sunny Abraham. I am a senior biology major with a concentration in cell and molecular biology and genetics. I'm from Newcastle, Delaware. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am one of two of the student coordinators this year for new student orientation. And hello, friends. It's so great to be here with you today. My name is Connor Holm. I am a senior English and biology double major from Hapro, Pennsylvania. My pronouns are he, him, his, and along with Cindy, I'm the other student coordinator for new student orientation. So we have so much in store for you all today, but before we get started with the rest of our welcome session, we have a short and very cute video to show you to introduce you to the rest of our orientation leader team. So. Let's meet the team. 
Hey there, Blue Hens! Student coordinator Sunny and Connor here, and we'd like to welcome you to our new student orientation experience. Our orientation leaders will show you what it means to be a Blue Hen, answer any of your questions, and get you accustomed to student life. Now, let's go meet the team! Well, we did say it was a really cute video, so we hope you enjoyed and really got to know our team a little bit. Well, we would love to get to hear from all of you as well. So now is your time to hype yourselves up in the chat. So either get excited, say hi to everybody, or we would love to know where you're from. So send where all of you are from just so we can get an idea of who's here with us today. This is my favorite part. I always love seeing where everybody's from. Yeah. Oh yeah, Delaware. Delaware. First All in. right. Let's go. And then you can cheer. You can get excited. Yeah. Yeah. I love the woohoo. All right. Let's see. A lot of Delaware people, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Portugal. Wow. Lovely. I love what I'm seeing. New Jersey, more Delaware, New York, oh, Massachusetts. So quick. The UAE. Hello. More New Jersey, New York, Virginia. Let's see, Alaska. Hello, Scotland. Delaware this is, is great. The best state, correct? Literally, I could look at these all day. This is my favorite part of the program. Well, I don't want to keep you any longer, but thank you so much. This is always so great to see. So feel free to, you know, use the chat, say hi, hype us up. Um, we will. So I guess we'll move on to the next part. Sunny, you can talk about yeah, our schedule. So we're just going to briefly go over what the schedule will look like for both our students and for our families. So for students, we'll start on this webinar link for our academic life presentation that will teach you everything you need to know to be successful in the classroom. And then students, you will leave this webinar and join another Zoom link where you'll be able to meet your orientation leader and go through some amazing sessions that they have planned for you. So Blue Hen 101, which teaches you all the basics of being a Blue Hen, building your inclusive Blue Hen community, as well as a health and well-being session. All right. And then for our families, Connor, you can take it away. All right, and looking at the family and guest schedule for today. So like Sunit said, everybody will stay here for the academic life session. So again, what it's like to be a blue hen in the classroom, we'll go over all of that. After that, we're going to be transitioning to student life. So that will be when all the students leave and go with their orientation leaders. So families and guests, you'll learn what it's like for the students outside of the classroom. After that, we'll have a health and well-being session focused on health, well-being, and safety, as well as a session about easing the transition into college, both for you and for your student. Finally, we will have a student Q&A panel featuring Sunit and I, as well as two of our amazing orientation leaders. And then that will be the conclusion of our program. Super excited. 
Yeah, so Connor and I have been a little sneaky throughout the beginning of this welcome session. And one of the reasons we do the roll call is to keep an eye out for our most spirited blue hen here with us on the Zoom call today. That person is going to win a $100 gift card to the UD Barnes & Noble bookstore that they can spend at their next on their next trip to campus. All right, so we do have a winner, so very excited. So can I get a little virtual drum roll? All right, thank you, Sunit, I appreciate it. So the winner of our UD Barnes & Noble Bookstore Speed Award is Amelia Schluter, and I apologize if I butchered your name there, but I'm trying my best. I just posted it in the chat, so that will be you. Congratulations on winning the Spirit Awards. So I just dropped your name in chat. Um, you did say OMG, so I'm, I, it looks like you figured it out, but we will send you an email. So expect an email from otp at udel.edu. We'll send you some contact information about how to access your Spirit Award. So congratulations to you for being spirited today. But with that, we are going to get started with our program. So thank you so much for um, kind of hyping us up and um, humoring us for this welcome session. So we're going to jump in for our academic life session. Today we have Catherine Stoner. She's the Senior Assistant Dean in the College of Health Sciences. So Catherine, take it away for academic life. Why, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the ac academic life portion of today's events. We are so glad that you are here. I am Katherine Stoner. I'm the Senior Assistant Dean in the College of Health Sciences. In today's discussion, I will be discussing important dates and deadlines for the fall semester, academic advising here at UD, a, the common reader and when it will be covered, as well as resources to help all students be successful. So next slide, please. All right, so we have three big groups of students on the call today. We have our first year students who are coming directly from high school. We have our transfer students that are coming to us from a different institution and our international students who are coming from around the world. I saw several of you in the chat. So um, welcome to all. And what you all have in common here today is that you are going to be new to UD this upcoming fall semester. However, we do realize we have many different majors attending here today and today's topic is academic. So I'm gonna keep our topics general and relevant to all new, new UD students. Uh, you will learn more specific information through the Canvas course modules, pre-advisement session, and of course your academic advisement appointments. And our family and support people who are on the call today, we also want to welcome you here too. And I just want everyone to know that we will have time at the end of this presentation for questions. Next slide, please. All right. So you have a new job as you come to UD and your, you, your new job is to be a college student. And that really is a full-time job. And part of that job is learning to advocate for yourself. For some, this may come very easily and naturally, and for others, it may be a bit intimidating at first. However, I'm really here to let you know that we are here to help you. So our message is please don't ever hesitate to reach out with your questions. And for our family members that are here today, this is truly a partnership. So I'm asking you that if your student at any point needs help during this journey, please encourage them to contact us directly. Practice makes perfect, and this really is a life skill that will be a key resource, resource in their future. And students, when you when you are reaching out for someone to someone and you don't know who to contact, always start with your academic advisor. Even if they don't know the answer to your question, they will know who will know, so they can get you to who can help. So um, when in doubt, start with your academic advisor. All right, next slide, please. So I think it's really helpful to kind of understand the structure of the University of Delaware. So here at the University of Delaware, we have 10 colleges and programs in total. And within the first eight colleges that are listed on that list, there are departments within the colleges and those departments offer majors. And students, you're gonna most likely identify with your major. So using an example from the College of Health Sciences, our students will say, I'm an exercise science major. I never hear a student say, I'm in the Department of Kinesiology and Applied Physiology, or I'm in the College of Health Sciences. They say, I'm an exercise science major. And that's normal, but it's still good to know who your department is because that's where you're going to find your chair and your professors and they're experts in your major. And it's good to know who your college is because that's gonna be where your assistant dean or director is and they're available for all of your student support needs. So students, you've probably already met your assistant dean or director during the pre-advisement session. 
And if you haven't done that already, you will meet them. And then you're likely to see them again at the academic orientation, which happens on Monday, August 29th, the day before classes. During this time, you're all income all incoming students attend an academic orientation where you're going to meet more of your professors and student support team members. Next slide, please. So important dates and deadlines. Um, first on the list is Tuesday, August 30th. This is the first day of classes. And I'm here to tell you right from the start, we do have 8 a.m. classes. And those there's a lot of times freshmen do take them because it's a lot of our foundation courses. So it's just a good reminder that on Monday night, get some sleep and get ready for this because your classes could very well be at 8 a.m. on Tuesday morning. And then the next date that we have right listed is Tuesday, September 13th. That's our drop ad deadline. So two weeks into every semester, every fall and spring semester, it's what we call our drop ad period. And during that time, you get to attend your classes. And if there's something that needs adjusting, maybe you, maybe it's um, a different course content, maybe it's a different time period, you do have the ability to adjust your schedule up until that drop ad deadline. Now, this first time around, as you're getting used to UD and the schedule, Please work with your academic advisor and don't do this on your own just to make sure um, you do everything right the first time. But that Tuesday, September 13th is a very important date to make sure that's in your memory or on, and, and on your calendar. Uh, because after that deadline, all of your classes are set for the rest of the semester. The next date is Friday, October 14th, and that's when our midterm grades are posted. So family members who are on the call today, I highly encourage you to put this date in your calendar and go ahead and plan to check in with your student during that time period and ask them how classes are going because they're going to be able to see their midterm grades. And midterm grades are not part of the academic re record. They are simply just a gauge in how the student is doing in their classes that semester. And it's for the purpose is if, you, if you're doing great, fantastic, but if you are having difficulties, this is the time to connect with people. So the first stop is generally always your professor in their office hours. Um, and the next step is the academic advisors and to talk that through because there are a lot of resources and options if there are difficulties. Next on the list is November 8th. That's just election day and it's classes are suspended. And then Monday, November 14th is another big important deadline where it's the change of registration deadline. And this is the last day that you can withdraw or change your grading registration in a course. And really, students only are really only doing this if they are struggling in the course or having difficulty. And this is really the time to connect with your academic advisor and talk about options. But I'm asking you, since we know this ahead of time, you have at the very beginning of the semester, you always know this time period. Don't wait until the last minute. The idea is you're really supposed to talk from the time you see your midterm grades if there's challenges up until November 14th, not November 14th, not on November 14th, please. And then, um, then that brings us to the end of the semester, which is Tuesday, December 8th, last day of classes, which leads us right into finals week for the, from the 10th to the 16th. And the messaging for finals week is please expect to be on campus up until the 16th. There are finals on the last day of finals week. And we say that right from the beginning because we know this is a very popular time where people are making family plans and vacation plans. And it is the expectation that you should be planning to be on campus until the 16th, because I'm sorry to say, no matter how expensive the plane ticket is, it is not considered an excused absence for a final. So you do know these deadlines well ahead of time, and you will be able to know your final schedule once it posts. And I, I, I recommend actually checking after drop ad just in case you do make changes. So keep those dates in mind and we can move on to the next slide, please. All right, we have an academic advising website here at UD that's a really wonderful resource. It's advising.udel.edu. So as I talk about um, while we're on this slide, please take a moment since we're all at our computers to go ahead and bookmark it, both families and students here. This site, what it does is it pulls together information from a wide variety of our UD uh, website. So it's from the registrar's webpage, the catalog, our colleges, our departments, it's all advising related. 
So it's where you can access that academic calendar where we just reviewed those dates and deadlines. They're all there. It's um, where you can find academic tools like how to schedule an advising appointment or read your degree audit or request an excused absence or calculate your GPA. I could go on and on. It's also a central places for all of our resources, which I'm going to go into more later. So this, uh, this summer, I really highly recommend that you take some time now that you have it bookmarked to go ahead and click around and get to know the site, see what's there and start marking other sites and um, pages that you think may be useful to you. Next slide, please. So advisement here at the University of Delaware. So first up is this, this what's happening this summer. And you're going to attend a pre-advisement session if you haven't done so already. And that's where they're going to talk about general to topics about your college as well as your major. And it's going to help prepare you for your advisement session. And this is also where you're going to learn who to contact. So that assistant dean or director or undergraduate student service office, this is where you learn their contact information because that's your go-to people anytime you have an academic question. Then you're going to have your virtual advisement appointment again if you haven't done so already and depending on your major it could be with a professional advisor or it could be with a faculty member. It also could be one on one or it could be in group the idea between the behind the summer advisement is that we're trying to offer as many po possible appointments as people as students are dealing with vacation and jobs, etc. So we just are getting as many out there. But no matter who you're meeting with, um, you are going to be talking about your fall schedule and your courses. I should actually have just said fall courses. Um, this is where you're going to talk about your test scores and your transfer credit if you have any. So this is a good time. If you do have that, just a reminder, please make sure that's sent to UD because that could impact your fall semester. But really, it's important to note that the fall courses that we're talking about putting on your schedule, that schedule is going to start being built, but it's not going to be finalized until August 3rd. This, our primary goal is to ensure that you're getting the courses that you need on your schedule. And at times to make everything fit, we may need to swap course sections, um, and that could that could change a professor that you're uh, that you've seen or a class time. So as you may have guessed, this is an extremely challenging task for several thousand students. So that's why we say very early on we're building schedules all the way up until August third. And really the message is don't fall in love with your schedule. Schedule, but also don't hate it either because things are still fluid. Really, our priority is making sure you get those seats that you need. Once August 3rd happens is when that drop ad technically starts. So you do have the opportunity to change your schedule, but please make sure you're talking with an academic advisor again this first time around because those courses are on your schedule for a reason and we just want to make sure that they stay there or, or you're making the right changes. After that, it's going to be you. You get to um, develop your own schedule every semester going forward. And um, you can take as many 8 a.m. classes as you want, or maybe not. Maybe you don't want 8 a.m. classes, but you will be able to develop your schedule and just plan to do that in the October, November time period when you're talking about your spring semester or possibly winter semester. Next slide, please. Our finish in four campaign. Okay, so we know that students want to complete their degree in four years, and we really want to support you in doing that. So we have this finish in four campaign. And it does pertain mostly to our first year students on the call, since we know our transfer students are very likely to be done in less than four years. Now, studies show that students who take a minimum of 15 credits per term per semester in fall and spring finish their degree more quickly than those who don't. And most people, I think, are probably saying, well, that's basic math. You take 15 credits times two semesters, that's an academic year, that's 30 times four years, that's 120 credits, which is the minimum to get a bachelor's degree. And yes, that, that's the math. But it's actually more than that because there is, um, once a student has taken the 15 credits and been successful at it, there is a momentum that happens from that. So they're more likely to do that again and again and again. Now we do say 15 credits per term, but students can, uh, full time to be considered full time is 12 credits per fall or spring semester. So if you want to still shoot for that 30 credits over the academic year, you may want to consider a winter or summer semester. So it's very unique to UD to have a winter semester. And that's a way that if you didn't want to take 15 credits your first semester or another semester for whatever reason, you have these options. But the overall message is shoot for that 30 credits per academic year to stay on track to finish in four. So I'm actually going to pause for a moment because we do have our students on the call and they have they are the experts in this. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on taking winter or summer session that you would like to add? 
I guess I can talk about it. Sure. So I took a winter session class and for me, I found it really, really helpful. So kind of looking at the perspective of trying to take those 30 credits per year, I was trying to follow that system to, you know, keep up that momentum, but I tend to be really involved when I'm on campus. I, you know, I work a lot. I'm in a bunch of clubs. So I took a winter session class in order to lighten the load in the following semester in the spring. So I thought it was really, really helpful. It's very easy to register. It is a shorter session. So winter session is five weeks as opposed to a traditional 14 week semester. So a little shorter, but it was the only class I was taking. So it felt like it was still a very good pace. And for me, it was extremely helpful, I was able to take one less class in the spring. And I know one class might not seem like a lot, but it really did free up a lot of time and helped me kind of, you know, follow this finish and force schedule and keep up that momentum, but kind of modify it to my own situation. So I think it is a helpful way. However, I know a ton of people who have never taken a winter session class. I know people who do it every winter. So it's not a necessity, but it is an option to kind of add a little bit more flexibility and choice to a student's schedule. Back to you, Catherine. Why, thank you very much. Um, and, and great points, thank you. Um, and our transfer students who are on the call, again, work closely with your academic advisor so you can make sure you get on, tr you get on track, stay on track, because it is gonna be unique to you. So next slide, please. Common Reader. So every year, a committee of very smart people choose a book for our first year students to read. So this year's title is Where the Earth Sleeps We Travel, Stories, Poetry, and Art from Young Refugees Around the World. And this book is available at the bookstore as well as amazon.com. And the Common Reader is discussed during the first year seminar courses. So every student has to take a first year, every high school, direct from high school student has to take a first year seminar course. And there's gonna be several activities related to the book during the course. And the authors will come to campus for a presentation. And in years past, we've even done essay contests. So a lot of fun things associated with the books. Now our transfer students, it is not required of you to read the Common Reader, but don't feel left out. You can still absolutely um, read it as, at your leisure. Um, and there is also a transfer transition seminar that's like the first year seminar, but it's very specific for transfer students who are coming transitioning to UD from another institution. So if that sounds of interest to you, please make sure you talk to your academic advisor so we can get it on your schedule. All right, next slide, please. What to expect next fall. So the, again, the experts on this are students, as talk, students to students. So our students on the call today, would you please talk a little bit about what you think it's good to know to expect this fall semester? Yeah, so talking about the first week of classes, um, this is really a time for you to get acclimated with your new schedule. It'll be different every semester, but specifically, you know, your first semester here at UD, it can be different. You don't have a necessarily a time blocked out to eat lunch um, or a time for breakfast or time for dinner. So you have to plan when to eat, um, getting to your classes. There's all kind of a whole bunch of things, a different, a lot of moving parts. Um, this is also a great time to get to know people. So, the, you know, the people you sit next to in your class, your professors, um, using that first week to really get yourself settled, but also prepare to have a successful semester is super important. And to do that, we have a tool called Canvas, which is kind of our academic hub. Um, you might have used something similar in high school. I know I use Schoology. A lot of people use Blackboard or maybe Google Classroom. But this is where all of um, our academics are held. So each class that you're registered for will have their own page. And you will be able to see um, announcements from your professor, assignments. You might have to submit assignments on there. Um, you can also take exams or quizzes on this platform. So it's really important to know how to use it. And kind of a plug, um, there is an NSO Canvas page that all the students should have access to right now. So it's not only helpful because you can, you know, use it to access all the information that we're learning today. So you can reference back to it throughout the semester, but it's also a great way to just kind of play around on the website, see how it's used, see what's offered on there and kind of get comfortable with it before the, before your classes start. And then lastly, academic, oh, sorry, office hours with faculty. Um, so office hours are basically um, an open door time that your professors and teaching assistants will have set up where you can go and talk to them about anything and everything you might want to ask them. This can be about, you know, clarification on content that you learned on class, um, asking them for ways to get extra help, or maybe you're interested in becoming a teaching assistant, you want to talk to your professors um, about how to help with that. 
but it's also super important because in your first year specifically, you might have larger lecture style classes. So two to 300 people per class. And it's really hard to get to know your professor then and for your professor to get to know you. So going to your, off, going to your professor's office hours is super important, um, getting to know them and they can know you. Um, and it's also super helpful because down the road, you never know, you might need a recommendation or um, could do research with that professor. So definitely stepping into your professor office hours and just getting to know them. And then on to academic advisement. So we've talked about it a lot already, and we're going to continue to talk about it just because it's so important, right? Your academic advisor plays a key role in helping to schedule your courses for your first semester. But even after that, students, when you start to schedule your own classes, your academic advisor is still a really, really great resource. It's just because they know so much about all the classes, they know all the prerequisites, they know requirements, they know when classes are offered, what classes you can and can't take. And this is really great because they do all that work for you and they're more than happy to meet with students. We advise students to meet with their academic advisor at least once a semester, just so they can stay on track and get to know them and build a relationship with them. But it's also just helpful to kind of get advice to kind of help to build what schedule you want. A really good example is during my first year, I met with my advisor and we made a whole Excel sheet that listed out what classes I would take in each semester up through my senior year. I still use that Excel sheet now and coming into my senior year. So I'm really detail oriented. And for me, that was really nice because I was able to like kind of prove to myself that, yeah, I can graduate in four years and still take all the classes I wanted to take. So it's just a really great example of how advisors can be really helpful. So we are just going to continue to talk about it, but just a reminder that they're really a great resource. And then finally, resources and support. So we're going to continue to talk about some of these resources, but just a good, like, um, you know, quick general overview of it is there's a ton of people at the university whose full time job is to support students. And this is really amazing. It's a really great opportunity for students to get support in all their different academic areas. And like I said, we'll continue to talk about some specific resources, but you have so many things at your fingertips, so many people who not only work to support you, but actually really care about your success. So that's really exciting. And that's a really great transition into the next slide where we'll talk about resources. Thank you, Connor and Sunit. Those were really great um, points. Thank you. All right, important resources. So there's lots of important resources at the university, but I'm gonna highlight these three right now. So uh, first we have the Blue Hen Success Platform, and that is going to be the platform where you're gonna make your academic advisement appointments as well as tutoring appointments. It's also where you see their your academic advisor schedule and send notes to them about what you wanna meet about if you maybe have specific topics so that can help them prepare for the meeting. We have UDSIS, which is the University of Delaware Student Support Student Information System. So some people say UDSIS, some people say UDSIS. It really depends on what you prefer, but um, you'll hear both sometimes. But either way, it's where you're going to find your class schedule. It's where you're going to do your registration and that drop ad. It connects you with Web Reg, which is the system where you're going to um, interact with your course schedule. It has the unofficial transcript, which is where it lays out your classes that you've taken semester by semester. And it has a degree audit. And I find this to be the most important tool personally, obviously I come from the advisement side of things, but a degree audit, what that does is it shows all the courses that are required for your major. And then every time you register for a course, it shows that, re that requirement as being completed. And so, and then it folds in upon itself like a, an accordion. So as you go along your time here, you're gonna see more and more of your requirements fold in. So when it comes time and your degree audit is completely collapsed, you know you are ready to, ready to graduate. And similar to the degree audit, we have a what if report. It's essentially a what if degree audit. And that has the ability to take the degree audit and do what it's doing for your major for any major or any minor at the university. So if you're thinking about considering um, changing a major or double having a double major or adding a minor, it takes all of the requirements for that major and shows against what you've already taken and what you've completed and what's still outstanding. So degree audit is a fantastic resource to know um, where you are in your degree progress. And it's also good to know when you register for a course that it actually satisfies. So great resource. Please remember degree audit, degree audit, degree audit. 
And then finally, the undergraduate catalog listed here, and that's super important because it lists all our policies and academic expectations. It also has the requirements for, again, every major and minor that we have offered at the university, and there is a lot. There are course descriptions for every course that we offer here, and the course descriptions are helpful because of obviously it explains what the course is, but it also lists the prerequisite courses that you would need to take if you're interested in taking that course. It's It will show when it's most likely likely going to be offered, so fall, winter, spring, or summer. Um, it's, um, it just lists all of the majors, course descriptions, etc. And then we have the four-year plans. Um, and this is really just a sample schedule of how your major fits into four years. So if you're not sure where to find the catalog, you now have that advising website bookmark because we just talked about that. And you can look under policies and procedures and find the catalog right away. Look up your major because it's under the college and you know your college because you're a pre-advisement session or if you are going to attend it, you're going to soon learn it. So you're going to see your major and you can look up and look up your four year plan and do that and see what your next four years could look like. Again, adjustments can happen based on your personal goals and minors and interests um, and schedule, but it's a good template to see what that's going to look like. Next slide, please. So I talked on the very first slide about being your being your own advocate. Okay, so and that is part academic support because um, now we're going to talk about more of the people supports that we have here, and um, there are so many. But it is up to you to let us know that you need the help so we can connect you to the right resource. So right off the bat, in your classes you have your professors, and they always have office hours that will be listed on the syllabus. If your office hours don't work your, with your schedule. You send them an email and they can often meet with you now with zoom and things that's even easier. Most classes will have teaching assistance, um, which is another resource to help answer questions. Sometimes they hold study sessions, etc. In your college, of course, you have your academic advisors and assistant deans that you're always your go to people again, no matter what the question we can point you in the right direction. We have centers, giant centers available. So we have the Center for Counseling and Student Development. So that's for that's therapy. So whether it be individual therapy or group therapy, topical sessions that they host. If you need long-term therapy, they can help connect you with a long-term therapist. Um, they're there for you. We have an Office of Disability Support Services and we nickname it DSS. You'll hear that a lot. Now, if you had a 504 or IEP in high school, please perk up your ears right now. We um, please go ahead and register with them this summer. Even if you don't think you're gonna want the same accommodations that you had in high school, it is so much better to have it registered over the summer and have them in your back pocket and, and you don't have to use them. But if they're there, it's so much easier in the middle of the semester to enact them than it is if you don't register and then you're doing that in the middle of the semester while you're trying to balance it against your coursework and um, their, the DSS appointment schedule. Summer is a good time. If you had that 504 IP, sign up this summer. Again, you don't have to use the resources, but they're always there in your back pocket if you need them and there's nothing wrong with that. All right, our Office of Academic Enrichment, that's our tutoring center. They have individual tutoring, they have group tutoring, they have drop-in tutoring, they offer skill building courses like study skills and um, they have one-on-one -on -one academic assistance. So that's more of a one-on-one -on -one meeting where you, you don't just talk about maybe a, a tutoring subject or a, a subject in particular, but you review your overall study habits and kind of talk about where you are academically so it can either help you excel or help you if you're struggling, kind of work, find areas Areas to work on. They have online and in-person workshops on time management, goal setting, note taking, test taking, study skills. Um, we also have um, subject specific centers. So the writing center, there's actually two different locations on campus in our Kent Hall and the basement level of Memorial. There are, there's the language proficiency center, there's the physics help center, there's the math and science learning lab, there's the chemistry resource. There are so many resources on campus for you. Again, all you need to do is ask. And that's where the advocacy of yourself becomes so important because we don't know what you need, but the moment you tell us, we are ready. So students, if you mind, if I ask you one more time, do you have any examples of resources you've used on campus that were helpful to you? 
Yeah, so you kind of touched, or Catherine kind of touched on it um, a bit towards the end, but we do have specific um, resource centers designated for certain subjects that student tends to struggle with. So I was an avid attender of the Chemistry Resource Center, um, and I really liked it because I went like three times a week and it was led by um, undergraduate students or upperclassmen who have taken the class and succeeded, but also graduate students who, you know, are studying this field. Um, and they were really there to kind of answer all the questions that I had. And I really appreciated how ingrained it was within the course structure itself. Whenever we went over a topic that was that the professor knew was particularly challenging, he would always say, you know, make sure to stop by the Chemistry Resource Center if you need any help. And it was really easy to just kind of walk in when I had a break between classes or um, know I needed help with something and get the help that I needed. So it's super, super important to reach out when you need the help. And I guess my one recommendation for everyone is reach out sooner rather than later. Um, it's better to kind of set yourself up for success and keep on rolling with the, you know, good momentum and um, the good speed that you're going with and try to have to play catch up later in the semester. So know what resources are there and definitely reach out when you need help. Thank you, Sneed. That was excellent. Excellent points. Um, next slide, please. All right, um, the Family Education Rights and Policy Act, and we, we nickname it again, FERPA, it was created to protect students' academic privacy. Therefore, we cannot share any grades or academic records, which includes grades and financial information, to any third party without the student's um, permission. So after this presentation, it's a very good time for the student, for you as a student and you as a family member to really talk together and discuss each of your expectations on how you're planning to share this information during the semester. So students, if you decide that you would like to grant permissions, you can visit the registrar's webpage and follow their instructions and give permission to um, access final poster, posted grades and financial information. Um, and if the student chooses is to do that, the approved person will get an email that will give them instructions for establishing their own login for, to this information so they can access it as uh, on their own schedule. And by the way, I know this was mentioned before, but the Blue Hen Family Hub is an also is another resource that gives regular updates of dates and deadlines um, pertaining to grades and finances, as well as general announcements and all kinds of information. Next slide, please. So next steps, um, attend your pre-advisement session if you haven't done so already. Again, this is where you're going to meet your college, your assistant dean and your major information. And it's going to prepare you for that virtual advisement appointment. And then of course, make sure you have scheduled and attend your virtual advisement appointment if you haven't done so already. There are also several modules in the online Canvas courses. They have important information that again, gives you um, specific information for you and please go through and complete all of them. Number four on this list, it's number four, it's in the middle, but it is super important. So please visualize this as being bolded and flashing. Check your UD email daily. This is where we are going to send you important reminders and updates and outreach. So that's how, it's, it's our only way to connect with you um, where, wherever you are. So it's extremely important that you are reading it regularly so we stay up to date with each other. Um, so again, I, I know that's not as common, particularly as you're coming from high school. So it is a good habit to start as soon as possible. Uh, number five, talk with your family, make that proactive plan about how you're planning to share that pro progress so you get your expectations set together at the very beginning of the semester. Six, um, take some time to think about your interests and goals and what you want to do with your future here. Um, you don't have to know everything, but just start thinking about it because you have so many opportunities between internships and research experience. If you're going to study abroad, um, getting involved around campus during the first week of school, especially you are going to have you're going to be presented with so many opportunities. And it's great to have ideas of what you what you like, but it's also good to go in with an open mind and say yes to things that maybe you haven't tried before because you're either going to find things that you didn't know you like or things that maybe you thought you really liked you realized you know what I, I like different things now so it's just a really great way to engage and find out what's going on so early on say yes to everything um, get to know campus but think about the things that you like because um, because you're going to be presented with options 
And finally, we just keep saying this and we're going to keep saying it. Reach out for support anytime you need it, because once you do, we are all here to help. So um, don't hesitate. Um, we are truly friendly and welcoming and ready to answer your questions. So with that, next slide. Thank you so much for your very kind attention today. We know this was a lot of information to take in, and I am happy to answer any questions about the topics we covered today. But keep in mind, we do have more uh, specific questions will be answered in the follow-up question, uh, excuse me, follow-up sessions um, during the new student orientation rest of events. So we do encourage you to utilize the Canvas calendar, the Blue Hen Family Hub Zoom for sessions with dining, fin financial aid, and student health services. So. Do you have questions? And we do have, again, we do have the Q&A box. So some of you have already put some questions in there, but if you have questions, we encourage you to put them in there. We have Catherine as well as our entire orientation team, which is more than happy to help answer any of the questions that you might have. So I see a question. Uh, I, I may actually ask one of um, Connor, how do you access your UDEL email? Is that? Yes. Pretty... So when you get your um, portal, which has all the information regarding like you've been admitted. So here are some next steps. It'll talk about advising and it talks about setting up your UD email. So if you haven't set it up already, that is kind of the method you can go to start to set it up. After that, it's kind of ported through Gmail. So if you would log into Gmail, but start to put in your UD email, it'll transfer you automatically to like the UD login portal where you can use your UD username and then your password to get to your email. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, and so I have another question. Do I choose all of my classes after August 3rd? What should be happening if you are a first year student when you have your academic advisement appointment, you are gonna be talking about the fall classes that you are gonna be registered for and they're gonna be registered for you. If you are a transfer student coming from another institution, because you are coming from another institution, we are going, to, there is um, an ability that we, you can add your own classes. But either way, talk with your academic advisor and they will answer all of those questions and get you all situated for the fall semester. But again, keep in mind that your fall semester Oh, your fall semester is going to continue to change up until August 3rd. So, but after that, um, you do have the opportunity to get in there and adjust it with your academic advisor's help. Okay. Sorry, uh, every I, I'm trying to read and then it pops through. Is, uh, does, is there any questions that you guys saw that we're, we should be answering live? I see some people are typing. Um, um, I think about, oh, sorry. Nope. No, I was going to say there's, um, we only have, just for the sake of time, we only have time for really to want, answer like one question live. So if you have one, we can go over. I just saw one that talked about paying for winter and summer session, but we can answer that. Um, we can type it in if you had a better question you'd like to answer live. I, I do you see, will my advisor ch help me change my major without an appointment? That's a great question. Um, yes, you can. They, if, if you connect with an academic advisor, they can send you the change of major form if you are sure. And then you can connect with, if the, if the change of major is approved, you can connect with the new college and your new advisor. However, you do need to talk with an academic advisor wherever your, where your major ends up being to, to make that fall semester. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. For the sake of time, we're going to move on. We, however, our orientation team, we are going to continue to answer your questions that you have in the Q&A box so you can get some answers for that. But for now, thank you so much, Catherine, for a great presentation. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me. I really enjoy this and I look forward to seeing everybody in the fall. It's just a really wonderful time and I'm very excited. So enjoy the rest of your evening. All right. Well, with that, we're going to transition to our student dismissal. So you will see on the screen momentarily, it will come up with the Zoom link for students. So the way that this will work, family members and guests, you can just remain in the Zoom session. If you are a family member or guest, there's nothing you have to do to go to the next session. You just have to wait here. Students, you're going to be transitioning to the Zoom session you can see on the screen. That will be the Zoom session where you will connect with your orientation leader. Just an important note is that you do have to be logged in with your UD credentials. That just means that when you log into Zoom, you put in your UD username, which is just the first part of your email, 
and then your password. If you're not logged in with your UD credentials, it will say you're not able to log on. So just a note about that. But we will also drop the link in the chat in just one second. But again, students, you'll be joining that other Zoom link. So you can click on that link and leave this session to go to meet with your orientation leader. If you have any issues or problems, you can just message us and we will help you kind of make that transition. We know technology can be a little difficult sometimes. But for families and guests, just so you're aware, our next session will be student life and that will begin in about five minutes. So feel free to stretch, do what you got to do, get a glass of water. We'll start in about five minutes. Again, you can stay here if you are a family or guest. If you're a student, you can follow the directions on the screen to go to the student breakout session. And again, if you have any problems, type them in chat and we're more than happy to help out. Aside from that, if you have questions as well, we're going to be typing answers in the Q&A box. So we appreciate you being with us.
All right, everyone. Hello, all families. It's time to now start our student life session. I am so excited to introduce Stephanie Chang, who is the Assistant Vice President of Institutional Equity within Student Life. Stephanie, you can take it away. Hello. Um, I turned on my video. Okay, great. Now you all can see me. Hello. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, again, my name is Stephanie Chang. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I serve as the Assistant Vice President uh, in Institutional Equity. Uh, that's a part of student life. Um, so I work very closely with my student life colleagues uh, and I report directly to the Chief Diversity Officer. Um, just so you know, a little bit about what I do. Uh, what I do is I oversee a lot of the student experience related to culture, equity, diversity, inclusion, and social justice at the University of Delaware. Um, so I oversee directly the Center for Intercultural Engagement, Student Diversity and Inclusion, and soon a advancing racial equity and inclusion plan that we're launching in student life. Um, I'm really excited to be talking to you all tonight. Uh, if you're, you know, eating dinner, having dinner, or listening to this during dinner, um, which is I just did listen to Catherine, but really excited to be talking to you all um, because I think it's so important for us to be more connected to families and parents in this process. Um, so I am a first generation student, which means that I was first in my family to graduate from college. I was also first in my family to go to get my master's and my PhD. And it can be really hard to navigate the college environment if you are the person who is either first amongst your siblings or you have a sibling who didn't graduate, but just college can be a really tough place to navigate, especially if you're a parent who may, or a family member or a support person who didn't go to college yourself. Um, it can be tricky. So a lot of times when, as we go through these slides, we're going to make references to, you know, if you didn't have this experience yourself, here are some resources or guidance that might be helpful. Um, so that's just a little bit about who I am. Uh, another little thing about me is I'm also um, a parent of a toddler, a two-year-old. So if you hear uh, him screeching, <laughs> Um, I am at home, so if you hear him, that, that is true, and I, I envy the position that all of you all are in, because uh, it would be great if he were off to college right now. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, so next slide. So first thing, you did it, acknowledging that family, you know, I family contribution is huge in this process. Um, so you, you know, the student that you have coming into the University of Delaware, the future Blue Hen, hasn't done this alone. Uh, they did this with you and other folks as well and their friends. So family takes on many different meanings. Um, it could be that it was an aunt, uncle that helped support a student to get here. It could be a parent, mother, father. Um, it could be a legal guardian. Uh, you know, it takes on really many different shapes um, and meanings. And the people here today, you all who are here on this session and this call, uh, have supported getting your student to this point. So congratulations for doing that. That's a huge milestone. Um, you know, I want to reassure you that being part of the Blue Hen community, uh, it's a journey, but we're all here for student success. So as this transition happens, um, we want to be partners with you and making this the most seamless transition possible. So the University of Delaware is, you know, can be for some folks a really large institution. And so how do we make this as seam seamless as possible and as personal as possible um, to make sure that you're prepared and your students prepared for the next chapter? Next slide. So now what? Um, parent family engagement. So Catherine talked about this a little bit in the previous session. So I'm just going to build off of some of the resources and comments that she made around parents and family engagement. Um, but now what? What is parent family engagement and how do we define it at the University of Delaware? Um, so you can see here there's a little bit of a description on this slide that we're building constructive relationships with UD families to capitalize on the strengths of what students bring, what you all bring, and then also what the Division of Student Life and the university can bring to support student success and development. So Catherine re referenced this Blue Hen Hub um, for families. Uh, and you can, there's, we'll talk more about what's on that, how to navigate that process. Um, and the website is here on this particular slide, sites.udel.edu slash families. We'll go on to the next slide. So I really appreciate this sort of reference, um, what is the role of a UD family member? So, you know, in this sort of metaphorical or analogy or sense is a UD family member is 
is here on the journey and taking you know their child or their student um, uh, different places. So the student's really driving the car here now, right? Like they're they're moving from a passenger to the driver and the family is a GPS. So as I mentioned, I was a first generation student. So it's first for my family to graduate from college. Um, and I would say it was actually really hard for my family to be my GPS. Um, so for some of you, you've been to college, you've been to university, it might be easy to be a GPS for your student, but for others, it could be really difficult because you actually are looking for your own compass to navigate this new role that you have as a support person of a student who's in college or at a university. Um, and so we're trying to help you find this compass and find, you know, help families become a GPS as much as possible. So as Catherine mentioned, reaching out is definitely part of that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more what the Division of Student Life does in that process. Um, next slide. So what is the role of Student Life? So I've mentioned the Division of Student Life is a key stakeholder in supporting student development success. So on this slide, you'll see here, we have a mission and a vision. We're here to deepen the academic experience and drive students' holistic development at UD and also beyond UD. So what students learn while they're at Blue Hen at the University of Delaware during their four, four or five, six years um, is something they should take with them beyond their time at the University of Delaware, right? There should be a lot of preparation that happens for whatever might be in this person's next journey. Um, and some, a lot of that could be career readiness or pre preparations for graduate school. Um, there's a entrepreneurship, whatever it might be. Um, so we see us, ourselves in the Division of Student Life as campus leaders in advancing equity and inclusion in that process. So as many of us know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice, you know, is, is really important right now in this, this year, this decade, this time frame that we're in. Um, and it's really important for a lot of different reasons. One, part of career readiness is that is working in diverse groups and teams. So how do we work effectively in that? So the Division of Student Life is here to help you know, give students opportunities to advance equity and inclusion in different ways. We welcome and rely on feedback to help us consider and be aware of changes and needs. So we have one pulse because your student is on campus, um, but you have another pulse. You know, what does a student bring home or what, do they, what are they not bringing home that you've heard um, in other places? Um, and so how do we work together to, uh, you know, do work that can speak to that feedback? Next slide. Um, more specifically about really what undergirds the work of Division of Student Life, it's our values. So our values are about amplifying student voice. That is students and their success are central and crucial to university mission. We commit to ongoing engagement with students so that we can include and promote their voice in our endeavors. Examples of this is that we have a student wellness ambassador program. There's a reflection on change podcast. There's also the Blue Hand Leadership Program that really helps develop students as leaders um, and give them skills that they could take beyond their UD, their time at UD. We pursue equity. We actively seek to remove barriers uh, to fair participation in student life programs and initiatives and commit to influence social institutional change towards a more equitable and just student experience. Um, a few examples of what that looks like. There's a laptop loaner program. I know this was really important during the pandemic um, as we're still in the pandemic, but during the time when we were fully remote, um, very quickly, we had to make sure that students had laptops if they didn't already have one. Um, and so there's that program. We also have a clothing coop for all gender and career closet. Um, so the clothing coop is brand new, uh, but it's bringing together two closets that previously existed. The all gender closet is to give students clothing for those who might be transgender or gender, um, you know, under a, a gender umbrella that uh, isn't specific. Um, so we wanna make sure that students have the clothes that they feel comfortable in um, and that they have access to clothes. Um, career closet is the same way. So the career closet gives students free clothes for interview purposes. This has been going on for a couple of years now. That's been really successful. Um, and we're really proud of that program. Something else to mention too, is that we'll have a new Center for Intercultural Engagement um, that will have a food and supply pantry. So something that I've heard from students is, you know, I have a really hard time sometimes getting groceries or I can't afford groceries. I know I have a meal plan, but sometimes I just need groceries that you know, supplement the meal plan in some different way um, so that we will be creating a food and supply pantry. In particular, that food and supply pantry will have 
foods that may not be common or popular. So another little thing about me, just to share another personal anecdote here, I, I'm an immigrant um, and uh, I'm actually a Taiwanese American. So I was born in Taiwan and then grew up in the States. And I often talk to students about their cultural background, where they've come from, and how can we at the University of Delaware make the experience more connected to what they might see in their own individual culture. So something that is of, related to the culture that, that I'm in as a Taiwanese person, Taiwanese American, as, and I don't know if anybody knows of these, but I love pocky sticks. And so when I say that to other Taiwanese students I've seen, or even Asian students I've talked to, they're like, oh my gosh, that'd be amazing if we had pocky sticks on campus because I can't find them anywhere. So that's an example of something that we might house and have in our food and supply pantry. Um, there's UT, UD internship grant programs through the Career Center. So pursuing equity also looks like being able to fund things that students may not be able to fund themselves, like internships. So there are a lot of opportunities for internships out there, either internships that are formal or in internships that are informal. And the Career Center is helping students to find stipends or funding that would support the internship experience. Transformational collaboration, another key value that we have at the University of Delaware in student life is recognizing that we accomplish more working together. Um, we will deepen partnerships across the division and throughout our campus to elevate our collective work. So we really want students to have a transformational experience, not a transactional experience, right? Not something where we're just, you know, bank telling in some way, but something that really feels like we're working together and there's something mutually beneficial that's happening. Examples here are residence hall career readiness integration for sophomore year experience. So what's really nice is that we have a lot of different programs in the residence halls. There's living learning programs. You know, there's a program called World Scholars where students are able to um, go study abroad their first semester and then come back together the second, but they all live on the same floor or in the same building. Um, and so that can be a really transformational experience for students, um, you know, and learning and innovation. So being at the University of Delaware, being in a college and a university setting, learning is key and pivotal to what we're doing. Um, it is the bread and butter of what's happening at, at our school. We strive to be a learning organization characterized by critical thinking, reflection, curiosity, generating knowledge and taking risks. Um, we expect that individual students and individual staff uh, share in that learning and fuel towards innovation. Um, a couple of examples of this, uh, using Star Res to coordinate move-in. So prior to Star Res, there wasn't a process for how does move-in happen? How do people get placed into rooms? Where do people sign contracts? So it was, Star Res was really helpful in that way. Career Influencer Network, that was a still relatively new program, but it's really innovative because it's getting folks across campus like academic advisors or admissions counselors to be actual career influencers. They've gone through a series of workshops and trainings to be certified as influencers. And they're building into having students becoming influencers as well, or student leaders being influencers. And so there's a lot of intentional touch points that we have for students at the university to really help prepare them for what does learning and innovation mean um, and how do you take that beyond your time at UD. Integrity and respect. Um, oh my gosh, this is such a core sort of component of just peopling right now to, in today's times. And so us in the Division of Student Life and at the university, we really want folks to demonstrate integrity, you know, upholding themselves as you're living 24 seven on campus um, in a way that really supports each other's interactions, understanding ourselves, working with one another, striving for respect, uplifting all the colleagues and students that you work with. When we fall short of this idea, we hope that folks are courageously holding us accountable. Um, so, you know, great example of this is our alcohol and drug amnesty program through student conduct. There are ways to report that, you know, drugs and alcohol were a part of an event or, or you used it or what something happened that led you to a place where there was a conduct violation, but coming forward to say and being honest about it. So I think that program is a really great example of um, where integrity and respect is being accountable to yourself. But also, we as an institution are accountable to students in that process, um, giving students the, you know, the rights to be able to come forward with something that's happened um, is really, really important. And then just to highlight that on the next slide, our partners and departments that are part of the division, Catherine talked about these already or made reference to some of them. 
the Center for Counseling and Student Development, CCSD, as it's commonly referred to as, is a place, as Catherine mentioned, for um, short-term you know, sessions around counseling, mental health support. There's many other uh, departments on here, the Office of the Dean of Students, which is, as I mentioned, the key office that houses our parents and family engagement process. Um, I have to just give a shout out to the Orientation and Transition Programs team. Uh, they're also part of the Division of Student Life as colleagues. I think they're doing amazing work right now this summer. So they're the ones who are helping to make the in-person and virtual sessions such as this happen for you um, and for us this summer. Um, and so I want you can find all of these resources and departments and programs uh, on our student life webpage, which is really easy to navigate. I often um, find myself Googling everything. <laughs> so if you're like me, you might end up just Googling UDEL and student life, um, which is totally fine too, but it's udel.edu slash student life. Uh, we have a live chat feature. So I was actually part of the team that worked with our communications team in the division to create a provide support live chat feature on all of our web pages. So if you go onto the webpage, you'll see on the lower right-hand corner of the website, there's a pop-up that comes up where you can click on a little sort of chat bubble and a pop-up will come, will come up and then you can select which topic or which department you will have a question about. So if you have a residence life and housing question that is listed, that is, there's a pop-up there. Um, if it's green, it shows that someone is currently live managing that. Um, I will say that the Career Center has been amazing about managing it live pretty much all day from eight to six. Um, it's There are other areas, if you can still send them a message, even if they're not live presently, um, you can still click on that pop-up, click on what topic you want to send a message to, and then the, in the message box you, box, you can send a message. But really some great divisions to call out. I think they'll also be really important to your student in their first year, student wellness health promotions, um, talking about the alcohol and drug policy, talking about sexual misconduct, um, also student health services. Uh, you know, that's a great place to get more, um, more uh, care on campus for students' health. And then, as, as I mentioned, I oversee student diversity inclusion. Um, we are not formally part of the Division of Student Life, but definitely a key partner uh, with the division um, in this process. Um, so we want to make sure that you have a seamless experience and that the experience is really lifelong and that everyone thrives in this process. So on the next slide, I'll start talking more specifically about the Blue Hen Family Hub, of how you as families can help us in that long-term thriving. So we have an online portal, as again, Catherine mentioned, for UD families that helps you support a successful and connected student experience, which leads to this long-term thriving process. Just real quickly, Dale shared a personal note related to how I've interacted with the Blue Hen Family Hub. Um, is that, uh, so I mentioned I have a, this little toddler, this little guy um, that is messy and loud and uh, has too much energy um, and sometimes hard to keep up with. So I, we take him to a daycare and I went to the, one of the teachers in his daycare, uh, did not know where I work or what I do, but you know, obviously I'm talking to this person every single day at drop off and pick up. And one morning randomly she just said, oh my gosh, I know where you work now. And I was like, oh, oh, this is surprising. And she's like, you work at the University of Delaware. My son is graduating from the University of Delaware and I am a parent of a UD student. And I was like, oh my goodness. So yes, you absolutely do know who I am because I just sent a letter through the Blue Hand Family Hub to all parents and families about the work we're doing in diversity, equity, inclusion, and the ways in which we're trying to support first generation students. So she was like, this was amazing. I knew I actually, and my picture was part of the process, part of the uh, letter that was sent. Um, and so she recognized me. So that's like kind of the nice thing about Delaware is that Delaware is a small state, you can run into folks. Um, and that was a really nice, uh, for her, a really comforting experience. For me, a little bit shocking of, oh my goodness, worlds are colliding. Um, but at the same time, I was actually like, oh, that's really exciting um, to hear that you you read the Blue Hen Family Hub and it's actually working. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. So I'll point a little bit more uh, information for you on this, what, how to navigate this hub. So uh, you should have recently received an email invitation. If you follow that link and fill out your profile, uh, found 
here, once you've logged in, you can obviously go to the little person profile looking person icon um, to join additional communities of interest and tell us how often you want to hear from us. Um, I, we'll go on to the next slide. So once you're in there on the left hand column, there's all these different communities that you could be a part of student success student financial services. I saw some folks had questions about financial services in the previous session. You know, this is a great way for uh, parents and families to talk to one another, but also to con stay connected with university resources, specifically the Office of the Dean of Students. Um, you know, so you can all find those feeds there, and then we'll go on to the next slide. Uh, and then you can also search things. So there's a search for previous posts uh, that's possible. So a bar appears in the top right of the hub. We'll keep going on to the next one. And then discover communities. So as you scroll down the front page, you can also click on discover communities, which is a shortcut to add new communities if you want to receive updates about those new communities. Um, I can't say enough about how really great this hub is. Uh, you know, the hub started relatively recently. Um, I've been at the university now for over five years. Um, and in that time period is when this hub started. And Again, I gave you a story of how uh, my toddler's, you know, daycare teacher is on the hub and saw my photo. Um, but also, you can get she got, you know, an email in her inbox. But it's just a really great way to see who might your student be interacting with and how to find some of these resources I've already talked about. So as you scroll down on the next slide um, of the hub page. Uh, if you scroll down to the home page of the Family Hub, you'll also see a link to a full calendar of events. This is updated regularly uh, with pertinent information related to the main UD calendar and has some exclusive events as well that will appear here on the Blue Hand Family Hub. We can go on to the next slide. Um, so resources for families. So as I mentioned, parents and family engagement rest in the Office of Student Engage is facilitated by the Office of Student Engagement, which welcomes complex questions or concerns from families who don't know where to turn for help. The Dean of Students or Families at UW.edu uh, is a great place just to send any question you have. Um, and any question can and will be answered. Uh, you know, often I think they're really complex things like I don't know how to support my student or my student asked me a question that I can't answer. And so just sending an email to families at UW.edu is a really great resource and way to do that. Uh, we recommend that everyone subscribe to internal news sources. You Daily is the internal communication uh, news source that is managed by the University of Delaware. UDel.edu slash UDaily slash subscribe is how you how you would subscribe to this. Um, I would say as a staff member, this is also where I go to get some University of Delaware news regularly as well. We once you subscribe, you can also get an email that prompts with office communications. Uh, updates and news or what is recent in New Daily. Just got my email today. And it's actually very helpful to get a pulse of what's happening on campus, what innovations are happening, what unique stories are there to be told. Um, and then there's also, you know, uh, this UD Parents Families closed Facebook group that you can sign on to. And as you can see, there's the calendar that we've talked about um, and other things here that we'll, we'll get into more specifics. But I really want to call out um, that you to encourage you all to save the date for the September 30th to October 2nd Parents Family Weekend. But we will go on to the next slide and I'll talk more about these things that we've listed. So resources for families. So this is your step-by-step -step guide, a family guide and calendar to supporting a successful first year and beyond for your student and also for you as a parent or family member of a UD student. Um, August slash 1743 welcome days is 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 currently in here on the calendar. Uh, each month you'll see insights of where what students may be going through and how you can help them. Um, can't emphasize enough how uh, helpful it is to have a calendar. Um, oftentimes it can really serve as a useful planner. We can go on to the next slide. Your student's sense of belonging and engagement is key to lifelong success. So if you flip through your calendar, you'll start uh, the new fall semester, the fall semester in September. You'll see some tangible ways to support the development early on with students. Um, a lot of the different dates that Catherine referenced uh, 
will be listed in this family guide and this calendar. Each month, is, there's also a highlight of a specific department or partner in student life that is especially relevant this time of year, uh, such as the Career Center highlighted in April, which offers a wide range of services to prepare students for employment, college, and beyond. Go on to the next slide. So I'll also just mention here the Office of the Parent Family Giving and the Parents Fund. So you can support the success of many students in your new UD community. Uh, consider serving as a professional mentor or host, in, uh, or hosting an intern within your organizations. Getting involved by joining the Parent and Family Leadership Council and supporting the Parents Fund. Last year, the Parents and Families Fund provided 1.6 million in support of to the university. Uh, and the Parents Fund, 306 campus programs were impacted by this support. Um, I will say the programs that I work with were directly impacted and will continue to be directly impacted um, by that support. Getting involved in supporting power, um, supporting uh, potential for all Blue Hens and allow us to expand the programming, which is really great. Um, so, you know, one way in which this has been really helpful is through the Crisis Fund. So the Student Crisis Fund was hugely important and relevant uh, when we were remote, fully remote during the height of the pandemic. Um, but it helped students provide, get funds for things that they may not have enough funds for. Um, so something that they need that would really support their academic experience is something that students can ask through the Crisis Fund. Um, and that exists. So there are funding possibilities out there. Um, and the Parents Fund has been an amazing place or source of that funding. So, so come to campus and join us for this year's Parents Family Weekend. I will be there. You can meet me in person. Um, the area that I work in uh, hosts multiple receptions. If you are uh, a family or parent of an LGBTQ plus student, um, we will have a reception for that, for students of color, for first generation students. And then just broadly speaking, a student who's really a parent and family that of a student who's really interested in social justice and diversity. Um, so it's a really great way to connect with other family members. So I highly, highly encourage folks to come and attend that particular session. Um, and again, it's just a nice way to uh, you know, see your student on campus. So I think that's like one of the first ways after move in that you really have this more community feel at the university where families come back to campus um, and experience, you know, sometimes it's a comedy show, sometimes it's something like a student performance or a play, sometimes there could be a concert by students, um, and then often there is a football game that weekend as well. Uh, so next slide. Um, so new student send-offs. So I have actually been to a new student send-off. These are times and opportunities for um, you as new Blue Hen families and parents and students to join us and meet us uh, around where you are located or where you're coming from. Um, and so there are two dates here, July 17th, uh, which is coming up this weekend, um, and July 21st. So I'll note here that there have been an overwhelmingly positive response to these events to celebrate new Blue Hen families. Um, we're nearing capacity for both events in New Jersey and Metro DC, and we'll be activating a wait list. Um, so when capacity is reached for that location, interested families may choose to be added to the wait list for the city of their choice. A UD representative will contact you when space is available. Um, but again, I highly encourage you to, to check out those events. These events are actually hosted by, as you see here, there's a host um, uh, hosted by uh, UD alums. Um, and sometimes they're also UD alums that are parents and families of UD students themselves. Um, so they're there to answer questions and they're also there to talk about the parents fund. So they're related to our parent and family leadership council and really, really great. Um, so if you wanna register, you can go to u.edu backslash, backslash um, NSSO. So we really hope to see folks there. We can go on to the next slide. Um, so this is where we'll hear from students again uh, uh, about appropriate familial partnerships. Um, so I don't know if Connor, Sunit, if you all have something to share here. Yes, we do. 
but I can start. So I always like to talk about kind of what my dynamic kind of looked like. So I'm the youngest of three. I have two older siblings who went to college before me. So going in, my parents and I kind of had an idea of what to expect but I still found it really helpful to sit down and have a very intentional conversation about how we're going to communicate, how often we're going to communicate and what that would look like for us. So for me, I'm really busy when I'm here at college. I tend to study a lot, but I also have a couple jobs. I'm in some clubs. So for me, kind of talking randomly wasn't really super helpful. I benefited from having structure. So what my family and I do is we FaceTime every Sunday. That's just our thing. I know some people who talk to their family almost every day. I know people who talk to their family a little bit more infrequently. But for me, just that Sunday structure works really well. Obviously, the situation can be very different depending on you and your student, but I really encourage you to sit down and have those conversations. I think being very intentional and open about how you want to communicate is important because it helps you to set and maintain good boundaries and helps you to kind of match each other's schedules. And honestly, it just helps each other things be a little easier because they can kind of be a little frustrating sometimes when you're trying to call and then they don't answer and then it's like phone tag back and forth. So um, sometimes I think it could be helpful to have those conversations. And I've also discovered that students tend to not be like me. They don't tend to initiate those conversations. So I think you as their support system might have to kind of initiate that. But that's just kind of a piece of advice that I found helpful from my experiences. Yeah, so I was one of those students that did not want to initiate that conversation. I kind of just let it roll and wanted to see how things worked out. I mean, it was kind of difficult in the first few years because I was a commuter student. You know, I still shared a wall with my parents. So it was like, well, how, in their eyes, it was kind of how much different can life be if she's still, you know, living at home, you know, going to class in the morning, coming back in the afternoon. But it was a lot different than that. I would spend a lot of my day, my hours throughout the day on campus in different clubs, meeting new people, hanging out with friends, whatever it may be. Um, so unlike Connor, I did not initiate that conversation. I waited until it kind of got a little too awkward. And then and finally, you know, my parents and I sat down and really talked about what it is that I'm doing at school. It was really helpful for them to know my schedule and know why I was on campus all the time. Um, and really having that conversation and kind of setting our expectations at that time was super beneficial, not only for when I was a commuter student, but also when I eventually moved on to campus. Um, now my family and I decide we do this kind of a bit strange thinking about it now, but we do play phone tag more or less. Um, my, you know, my mom might call me in the middle of the day and I just don't answer because I'm in class or I'm hanging out with friends or whatever it may be. Um, but the, the kind of caveat to that is that she does not get mad. So um, we know that like if someone doesn't answer just because they're busy and the same thing for her, sometimes I call her in the middle of the work day and she just doesn't answer because, you know, she's at work doing whatever she needs. So we just kind of know that we'll get in touch with each other, but sometimes random thoughts pop into your head and you just want to call your parents. So um, it really worked for me with that, but I guess kind of to sh our stories kind of show that like it's different for each student. So talk to your student, ask them how you can best support them and what you can do to make sure they know that, you know, while they're here enjoying life, um, you know, experiencing college and on all of its glories, they also have a support system at home that they can always reach out to. That was, that was great. Um, thank you all so much for sharing. You're really uh, bringing me back to my own college experience. Uh, again, as, as I mentioned, uh, as a person who was first in my family to go to college, I feel like I forced a uh, connection onto them. Uh, I went to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, and uh, my home was in, at the time was in Durham, North Carolina, which is just down the street or down the a little bit of a local highway. Uh, and I went home every weekend to do my laundry um, to the point where my mom said, don't come, don't keep doing this. You can't keep doing this. Um, <laughs> and now I also have a relationship where I call my mom every day as an adult. Um, all right. So we can go on to the next slide. Thank you all so much for sharing. I really appreciate it. Um, so this is the time for questions. Again, you can always email questions to families at udelta.edu. Um, it's a great way to, to sort of just put out anything that's complicated or if you don't know um, or you can't find a person to connect with, families at UDL.edu for sure will work. Um, so now we'll just open it up to questions.
And we're going to be using the same system as before. So again, if you have questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A box. Stephanie, as well as our staff of um, orientation friends, will try to help answer any of your questions. So I see here there's this one question about when is parent family weekend. Uh, it is um, it is September 30th to it is September 30th to October 2nd. There will be a registration for that. So definitely look out for when that happens. Um, I know before we went fully remote uh, prior to the pandemic, um, I remember one year where registration went out for parents family weekend and uh, sessions where you can register for different sessions are happening, um, but or just register as a whole. And it was amazing. There were over 1500 families uh, on the first day. Um, and there was also a sold out uh, comedy show that particular year. So definitely look uh, early to prepare for that particular trip. Um, Cause that definitely happens. Uh, I'm looking at some other questions here. It looks like there's some questions about housing. Is there help for housing for transfer students if they can't find something on their own? I think that's a great question. Um, and so there's there definitely is, I see Kelly's typing in a, a response, um, but there is a commuter transfer student housing guide that has been created in the past um, that can help folk, that gives folks information about local uh, apartment complexes, et cetera. Um, so I, Kelly put in the link there for the actual off-campus living website. And that is updated regularly. Well, it seems that the questions are kind of dying down. So if you do have further questions and then, you know, think about it in five, 10 minutes, you can drop them in the Q&A box. We are more than happy to help answer them. But I think for now, we will try to transition to our next session. So thank you so much, Stephanie. It was a really great presentation. We really enjoyed seeing you. So we appreciate it. Thank you so it. much. Congrats again. Thanks. All right. Well, with that, I suppose, like I said, if you have any further questions regarding student life and all that good stuff, we are more than happy to answer them. So drop them in the Q&A box as they come up. But we will keep going ahead and transition to our next session of the evening. So next up on the list, we have our health and well-being presentation. So we will jump right into that. And it is moderated by the lovely Helen Ann Lawless. So Helen Ann, you can take it away. Thank you so much, Connor. Uh, long time no see. I'm sure some of the staff already talked about this already, but uh, we did an in-person program again today. So today has just been uh, a full NSO day and it's really exciting, but I feel like this is sort of like a summer fire time chat version of NSO. Um, and we're really excited to share more about student health and well-being resources on campus. Like Connor said, my name's Helen Ann Lawless. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Director of Strategic Well-Being and Training at the University of Delaware. Um, we're trying something a little bit new tonight, um, just to try and capture some feedback from uh, participants. I dropped a link in the chat of a three question pre-survey. Your feedback at the beginning and the end of this session will help us improve the session in the future and ultimately help us better serve students. Um, so if you are feeling up to it, um, check that link out. Uh, if not, uh, just hang with me as I kind of give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so like I said, we're going to be sharing about student on health and well-being resources that are available for your student on campus. And just to kind of ground us in the importance of this topic, um, we know that health and well-being play such a key role in your student's ability to thrive and be successful, not just during their time on campus, but also well beyond that as well. Um, and we also know that when, when students choose to, to leave the university, sometimes the top reason that they list is a health or well-being concern. So we really wanna take a proactive and a preventative approach um, to make sure that we are providing as much support and resources for your student, um, again, to set them up for success. 
And, you know, again, thinking about this big transitional moment and how they'll be navigating these systems, it's going to be a lot different than what they may be used to in the past. Um, and when we're in person, uh, we usually do this kind of exercise or activity where we ask participants, the families in the audience to raise their hand if they made all of the appointments for their student to go see a pediatrician when they were growing up. All the hands go up. I ask them, how many of you have driven your student to those appointments and continued to drive them even when your student have a had a driver's license? Again, parents start to giggle. I'm sure you are relating to this as well. You are sort of um, the expert in helping them navigate a healthcare system, which is incredible. Um, but now that's going to be a little bit different because they're going to be um, responsible for calling and making and maintaining the appointments um, that they'll have with our staff across our three units when they're trying to navigate healthcare. Um, so um, yeah, this is a big transitional moment. Your students getting a lot of the same information, good conversation starters for the rest of the summer to check in with them about what stuck out to them in this presentation um, to help plan for what the fall semester will look like for them as well as how they'll interact with us over the next four years. Next slide. All right, so student well being is the term that we use to describe the three units on campus that are working on health and well being resources for your students. Um, and if you advance the slide for the three dots to, to show up, the, the first of these three units is student health services, um, which is the campus's, um, you know pretty much the equivalent of what you would find at a primary care provider's office or an urgent care. And then there's the Center for Counseling and Student Development, which uh, is the campus's primary mental health provider. And then finally, student wellness and health promotion. Uh, it takes more of a preventative and an educational approach to maintaining your students' well-being. Uh, and they also provide some one-on-one -on -one services as well, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, but at this time, I wanna turn it over to um, my colleagues who are joining me today from each of these three units, just to introduce themselves and share about what unit they're representing. So uh, Kelly, you wanna go first? Sure, good evening. Hi, I'm Dr. Kelly Frick. I'm a family medicine physician and an interim, uh, the interim medical director at Student Health Services. Awesome. And Kelly and I are twinning with our virtual backgrounds. Um, Greg, I think, uh, are you with us tonight? Can you go next? I am. Hi, I'm Gregory Cooper. I'm a psychiatric advanced practice nurse and prescriber at the Counseling Center at the University. Awesome. And Amy. Hello there. Uh, my name is Amy Richardson, and I am the Assistant Director of Substance Use Intervention Services at Student Wellness and Health Promotion. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, you're going to be hearing more from our panelists in just a second, um, but if we go to the next slide. There are just a few other things I, I want to talk about real quick, especially since we are in a virtual format. Um, I wanted to share a little bit more about where we are located on campus. And this is a really exciting time because the three units that we just talked about are now all co-located on the same central area on campus uh, and what we call student well-being on the South Green. So if you're looking at this map that you see on your screen, that, that light blue circle at the bottom of the screen is the fountain. So if you're standing at the fountain and you're looking down the South Green, which with the library on your right, the you know Memorial Hall behind you, that first building that you see down the green is Laurel Hall. And that is where Student Health Services is located. Next slide. So here's just a little bit of a sneak peek of what the facility looks like, as well as some of the services that your student may find there uh, and the amazing clinicians and practitioners that they'll be interacting with. Um, again, this is kind of a good opportunity for you to get to know us um, in a virtual format. Uh, but yeah, we just wanted to give you a, a snapshot of, of what our one of these facilities looks like. Next slide. All right, and then, so you're looking down the South Green, Laurel Hall is directly in front of you. Uh, that last building on the right-hand side is the newly renovated Wellbeing Center at Warner Hall. And like I said, um, now all of these offices are centrally co-located next to each other before they were in all different buildings across campus. So we're really excited for Student Wellness and Health Promotion and the Counseling Center um, to have offices in this new newly renovated space. Um, next slide. Additionally, the first floor, the entire first floor of Warner Hall um, is dedicated 
student space um, for students to engage in programs um, and educational sessions and also to kind of explore and learn more about the different health promotion and prevention skills we're instilling in them to maintain their wellness. Next slide. We're going to be talking about a lot of comprehensive student well being services that the university offers and by and large, the vast majority of services you'll be hearing about today are covered by the well being fee that's included in the tuition of all full time students. So if you have a full time student, there is no additional extra cost or out of pocket cost um, for the vast majority of services that we'll talk about today. A little bit later, I'll drop um, a link in the chat where you can learn more about um, what services are included and what services might have some additional out of pocket costs or you know bill insurance. Um, but ag again, just want to really emphasize that uh, vast majority of those come at no additional cost. Next slide. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Greg uh, to share more about all the services from the Counseling Center. Thanks, Helen Ann. Um, again, I'm Greg Cooper, and I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner. And I've been uh, in and around the university in different capacities. Uh, it'll be 30 years uh, this fall when I first stepped onto campus as a freshman. And I can tell you that uh, the investment in student life has been significant. Um, and it's just exciting. It's a great time to be at the university. Um, and you parents have made a great choice. Um, the Center for Counseling and Student Development, as Helen Ann said, is the primary um, mental health hub at the university, we call it CCSD. And we are a full service um, psychiatric and psychological mental health provider. Um, we have a whole host of psychologists and mental health clinicians. Uh, we're open eight to five. And in the fall, uh, we'll have some after hours, uh, later hours as well. Um, and we offer individual and group counseling consultations, um, psychiatric evaluations and medication management. Um, we do outreaches and uh, as well as workshops and emergency and crisis counseling. In addition, we also have a, uh, a hotline that is staffed by clinicians 24-7. Uh, um, we're very fortunate to have three prescribers at our counseling center. Um, many counseling centers do not have any. So we can pretty much handle anything uh, that the, uh, the student body wants to throw at us. There are a couple of things that um, we can't handle that some, there, there's some psychiatric and some psychological conditions that um, are a little bit more specialized and lend themselves better to uh, specialty practices. Um, and if you think that may be the case, or if you have a student who is in treatment right now, you can if we were in person, you could talk to me on the side, um, but you can call and set up a consultation time uh, with one of our psychologists and we can basically walk you through, um, you know, kind of a, a, a nice easy transition onto campus um, and communicate what we can do as far as uh, your students' mental health needs and um, whether uh, somebody might need to be referred out for specialty care. A lot of questions come up about medications and do we switch therapists and things like that. You can ask those types of questions as well. Um, we can pretty much handle and, and sync uh, with medications. Um, and the whole goal is to provide a, a seamless transition for the students when they come to campus and then when they go back home. Um, and uh, one other caveat is uh, and you'll hear a little bit about this later, is to uh, just check um, whether your insurance has uh, out-of-state coverage. Um, and uh, so we don't have any surprises, you know, at the, uh, you know, if we need some type of care um, and then, you know, we run into a difficulty. And I think they'll, they'll talk about that a little bit later. Thanks, Helen Ann. Thank you so much, Greg. All right, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kelly Frick. Thank you. Next slide, please. 
So Certain Health Services is your student's uh, primary location for healthcare uh, while they're here at UD. Uh, we offer both in-person appointments and telehealth appointments. Uh, certainly our uh, balance of telehealth to in-person uh, visits has shifted now that the pandemic is uh, kind of uh, moving into an endemic phase. So we are almost 100% in-person now, but we still do have some students who opt for telehealth visits for various um, concerns. We have a large staff of nine physicians, uh, four nurse practitioners, 30 nurses, and six uh, techs whose sole purpose is to provide physical health care for the students at the University of Delaware. We have a blend of a primary care kind of routine health visit model, as well as illness and injury appointments. We are able to help your student with whatever chronic medical condition they may have followed their PCP for at home. So if they have asthma, thyroid problems, diabetes, hypertension, celiac disease, uh, really anything that they saw their primary care doctor for, we're able to help them with that while they're here at school. The other half of our visits are same day appointments, so illness and injuries, um, everything from strep, mono, to concussions, lacerations, fractures, uh, abdominal pain, uh, really anything. Uh, we have a large array of sexual health services, so we do a lot of STI testing. We offer PrEP for HIV prevention, uh, pap smears for cervical cancer screening, a lot of birth control, uh, and a lot more as well. We have a lab on site, uh, so both a lab that can uh, perform point of care testing. So that's testing that your student has in conjunction with an office visit. That would be something like a strep test, a COVID test, a flu test, a mono test. Uh, but also our lab is able to draw specimens to send to outside reference labs like lab for request. So if your student has a lab order from their doctor at home or from a specialist off campus, they can actually bring that lab order to the lab at Student Health, have their lab work drawn there, and then the results would be sent to their ordering provider. Um, in terms of uh, x-ray, we also have an x-ray suite on site as well. We have nutrition services, so full-time nutritionists who are able to help with kind of general nutrition guidance, general eating habits. So now that your students are in charge of what they're eating, when they're eating, how much they're eating and drinking, um, as well as nutrition therapy that's specific to medical conditions. So if your student has irritable bowel syndrome or lactose intolerance, hypertension, obesity, uh, really anything you know where nutrition plays a role in the care of that condition and the management of that condition, they're able to uh, assist students as well. Uh, we have a large immunization and allergy clinic. Our immunization department provides all routine, all uh, recommended and required vaccines. We also offer travel vaccines. So that's typhoid vaccine, yellow fever vaccine, and malaria prophylaxis. Uh, we'll talk about allergy injections in a minute. We also have a dispensary on site, which is a, a very convenient option for students to fill prescriptions and buy over-the-counter medicines. And then we have sports medicine services. So both sports medicine services for the general student population, as well as our intramural and club sport athletes. Our NCAA student athletes are cared for at the Whitney Athletic Center, which is down uh, near the football stadium. Um, but those services are provided down at that location. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we might have skipped, did we skip a slide? No. Um, so we'll move into a frequently asked questions. So probably the biggest one we get is what immunizations are, is my student required to have? So UD students are required to have uh, two doses of measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, um, as well as one dose of meningitis ACWY vaccine after the age of 16. And the brand names of those vaccines are Menactra, Menveo, and Menquadfeed. And for COVID-19 vaccine, the university requires students to be up to date with COVID vaccine as defined by the CDC. So the current definition is a primary vaccine series plus one booster when eligible. The website there link at the bottom of the screen will take you directly to the student health website where it has all of the required health history forms, tuberculosis screening, more nitty gritty details about the vaccines that are required, as well as instructions on how your student can upload their vaccine docu documentation, which will go directly into their uh, UD health portal, which is the patient portal uh, here for students. Next slide. So does student health offer allergy injections? Yes. Um, so uh, most students who uh, opt to um, 
transfer their allergy injections to us, um, find this a very, very convenient service for them. So we typically are able to find a time that works well with their class schedule, and they can schedule their weekly allergy injection visits at the same time every day or every week for the entire semester. Um, we do require that a student has received at least one of their allergy injections previously at an allergist's office so that we can have the plan of care from the allergist and um, then uh, we'll be able to follow the protocols of how to build up their serums. Um, if you're interested in continuing your student's allergy treatment uh, with uh, student health, please connect with our immunization department sometime during the summer or shortly after the semester starts so we can arrange getting the serums, whether that's shipping them to us or you, you, you bringing them, your student bringing them, as well as make sure we get the plan of care um, from your student's allergist. And then a couple questions about um, health insurance. So as Helen Ann mentioned, um, most of the services that, that student health um, provides are covered under the well-being fee that all uh, students pay as part of their uh, full-time students pay as part of their tuition. So all visits at student health, um, and th this is separate from health insurance. So UD, UD does offer a health insurance plan for students, um, but it is not required that your student enroll in the UD health insurance plan. All UD students are required to have health insurance, but again, you can opt to uh, keep your current health insurance plan, or you can opt to enroll into the university's health insurance plan. Uh, I think somebody's going to drop the link um, for the health insurance plan into the chat. So as Greg said, please take a look at your current insurance plan, look at their out-of-network coverage, or look at their out-of-state coverage for Delaware, and look at the plan that the university offers and pick what makes sense to you and you, for your student, for your student's health care needs. Um, regardless of what health insurance plan your student has, all students are able to use student health services. So all the services at student um, at um, the counseling center, at student health services, and student wellness and health promotion utilize the well-being fee, which is part of the tuition that your student pays. So all the visits with the clinician at student health services, so that's all of your routine health visits, um, sexual health visits, illness, injuries, travel consults, nutrition consults, sports medicine visits, all the point of care testing that we do. So that's um, strep, throat cultures, COVID, flu, mono, CBCs, SCD testing, HIV testing, urinalysis, urine microscopics, and urine pregnancy testing. All of that is included uh, in the well-being fee. There's no copay, no extra charge. There's no copay for lab draws. There's no copay for allergy injections or immunization appointments. The only things that do uh, involve health insurance at student health are things that we contract with an outside agency for. That would be something like a prescription, uh, a vaccine, so the actual vaccine product, uh, or an x-ray. And again, there's more information uh, through the links in the chat. Um, if you have questions about the UD Health Insurance Plan, please utilize the contact info that's on that website. Um, the UD Health Insurance Plan is not managed by Student Health, um, but they have an, a phone number, an email address, and a lot of info on their website. They're, they're wonderful to uh, help with questions. Uh, next slide, please. And then a little bit more about our dispensary. So this link down at the bottom of the screen will take you to a list of over-the-counter medicines that we offer at the dispensary, uh, mainly medicines for symptom management, whether that's Tylenol, ibuprofen, and cough medicines, decongestants, uh, Imodium, allergy medicine, uh, topical antibiotics, topical steroids. We do have plan B. We offer Monistat as well. Um, we have medical supplies, so thermometers, pulse oximeters, which are more relevant uh, during COVID, and peak flow meters for our asthmatic students. We also have prescription medications. So we do carry a supply of mental health medications, um, antibiotics, antivirals, um, uh, inhalers, prednisone, steroids, anti-inflammatories, acne medicines, birth controls, all those things. It is important to note that um, prescriptions at student health can only be filled if they're written by a University of Delaware provider. So if your student has a prescription from their doctor at home or a prescription from a doctor off campus, they would not be able to fill that prescription at student health. Um, you'd have to use a retail pharmacy uh, in, in the Newark area. If you would like to transfer your student's management of that medication to the, the physicians at Student Health, we certainly are able to help with that as well. So if, if that makes more sense for your student, um, we just require that they have an initial consult with a, with a physician at Student Health uh, to get to know them, their me medical condition and, and the medication, and then the physician at Student Health can take over prescribing that medication so they can get it filled locally. And I'll kick it over to... Uh, student wellness and health promotion. Hello, again, my name's Amy Richardson, and uh, 
student wellness and health promotion is student centered. And what that really means is that we're here to meet your student where they are and help them meet their well being goals through support and guidance. Uh, we offer safe and confidential services that are designed to help your student improve their general well being related to drugs and alcohol, or maybe explore entering into recovery. Uh, and also to overcome any challenges associated with substance misuse and the harm that's caused by acts of sexual misconduct. Now, one thing that we want to normalize, not every student drinks. Last year's first year class, 69% of them were non-drinkers, meaning that they hadn't had a drink in the last 30 days, or they were abstainers, according to our alcohol EDU data. Um, so, like I said, we want to normalize that college doesn't always have to be what we sometimes see in the media or in pop culture. Uh, so, I heard this mentioned earlier, we really strongly encourage you to discuss alcohol use with your student before they come here for their first semester and remind them that they don't need to drink just because they're in college. Uh, now, at Student Wellness and Health Promotion, we offer opportunities for students to get involved in wellness and well being work in order for students to have a positive impact on their campus community. As such, your student is going to learn how to safely stand up and speak in support of the community in whatever way makes sense for them. Not all active bystanders or upstanders are loud superheroes who swoop in and save the day. There are many active bystanders who can quietly move mountains too. So our pro tip for families, we provide supportive, confidential and welcoming environments that allow your students to explore ways in which they can better themselves. Um, but students don't really realize that our services are available until they need them. So we're going to ask that you kind of be their memory and encourage them to seek out our support when it's necessary, remind them of our services, and that it's always, always okay to ask for help and to explore ways that they can improve their well-being, no matter how difficult that might seem. We're here to support our students, and we're asking that you help to, to remind them that our services are available. All right, thanks, Helen. Helen Ann? Thanks, Amy. Next slide, please. All right, so I just want to go through really quickly two extra resources um, that are so crucial to maintaining your students' health and well-being during their time here. Um, and, and some of this might echo some things that you've already heard from other presentations. Um, so I'm just going to go through really quickly. Um, so we know that well-being doesn't begin and end with the resources provided by um, the student well-being units that you just learned about. Um, it happens all across campus, and the university is really committed to um, creating an environment where students can thrive um, and maintain maintain their well-being. Um, so first, the Office of the Dean of Students helps coordinate basic needs support for students and also coordinates medical leave of absences. absences. Um, and I just want to underscore, you know, why are we talking about basic needs? Um, we know from national studies that one in three college age students uh, who attend a university in the United States struggle to provide basic needs for themselves, whether that be food or clothing or housing or having enough finances to get by. Um, and so the Office of the Dean of Students co helps coordinate that. Next slide. Additionally, we just want to underscore the key role that disability support services plays in creating an accessible, welcoming environment uh, that sets students up for success. Uh, and this is especially, uh, obviously, in the name, true for students with a disability. So if your student has a disability or maybe they had an IEP in high school, um, please contact Disability Support Services over the summer to learn more about what the process is like to register a disability with the office. Um, and then they will work with you to determine, and your student more importantly, to determine what accommodations um, fit the circumstance of your student and what will best, best match their needs. This could mean extended deadlines on tests, or maybe they have a note taker that's with them in class class, um, or uh, maybe they're allowed to bring fidget toys to class or, or different accommodations like that. All of that makes a more accessible uh, college environment where they can thrive and be successful. Um, and then again, I also want to underscore and kind of destigmatize when, when we're talking about uh, disabilities, that usually we're thinking about physical impairments, whether that be mobility concerns, hearing impairments, visual impairments, things like that. Um, but it also includes 
uh, disabilities that are not necessarily visible, right? So um, if a student is neurodiverse or if they have a mental health condition or maybe they have a traumatic brain injury, um, many of those conditions uh, may be eligible to be registered as a disability with disability support services. So if you're not sure, reach out to those folks, um, get in touch with them, uh, and they will help you and your student determine the best next steps. Next slide. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Mary Ann, um, from the Counseling Center, who's going to take you through the next part of this session called Easing Transitions, um, and then we're going to regroup for uh, some Q&A uh, if we have time at the end. So Mary Ann, take it away. Thank you, Helen Ann. I appreciate it. Hi, everybody. I'm used to doing this program and being able to see you, so I'm missing seeing your faces, but I'm really happy to be here. Uh, this is one of my favorite programs to do because I too am a parent and I've been doing these talks since before I had kids. And now I have a rising sophomore, no, a rising junior, changes every year, a rising junior at UD. And I've got a rising senior in high school. So I feel like I have a lot more credibility than I used to have. At the beginning when I gave this talk, I leaned heavily into my experience helping students adjust to college. And now I can lean on some parenting things as well. Um, so just want to start by giving you a view of this beautiful building. That is the new uh, well-being center um, called Warner Hall, and it's right next to Student Health. So kind of behind and perpendicular to that building is Student Health. Uh, that is part of a really big effort we are making to integrate our services and make things more seamless for our students. We really know that well-being is best served as an integrated process. And as the panel talked about, all of our offices are now able to work more seamlessly and we're able um, to help students get around more easily. Um, next slide. Oops. Okay, there we go. So this is the fun part. We're going to talk about preparing for college. The first thing I usually like to ask parents to do is to think back to when your student was going off to kindergarten. The process of launching students starts early. It starts really from when they first take their steps um, and when they're kind of pushing off around age two and they're going out, wandering away from us and then looking back to make sure we're still there. Um, so think back about your student and how that transition to kindergarten or first grade went. I want to remind you that you already know a lot about how your student manages change and manages transitions. You could probably make some pretty good guesses about how the transition to college might go. If you were a live audience in front of me, I'd ask you to raise your hands to tell me about uh, whether this is a first student that you're launching or whether this is a second or a third or a last, or sometimes it's a first and a last, because all of those things matter. If in the audience I had a lot of folks who were launching second, third, and fourth, um, I would applaud you for your experience and say that you can be a resource to the other parents. Um, so uh, next slide. Click it one more time. There we go. So when you're dropping off the students with your cars loaded down with, with um, all kinds of supplies, refrigerators, you name it, all those things you're bringing, you may ask yourself, how long should I stick around? Now that the car is unpacked and my students settled in, um, how long should I stay? And our joke at the Counseling Center is that you're saying, when should I leave? And your student may be saying, when will they leave? That's actually a good sign if that's the question they're asking. Um, one of the things I would say is don't get a hotel room and stay for another week. We really recommend that you rip that Band-Aid off, you know, unpack the car, take them out for dinner or lunch, and then head down the road. 
And it's perfectly normal if you have some tears in your eyes as you're heading away. I think a lot of parents do. I recognize there's also the other parents who are going, woohoo, we just, we just acquired an extra room in our house. Um, but just so you know, I, you know, I think if you leave quickly, it gives that student a chance to then start making their connections in the dorm. Okay, next slide. Okay, a drop off unload, help them set up their room, take a picture. It will never look this way again. Um, I think you probably know that, but it's true. Um, you've got them all settled in, you've done what you can, and now, now it's time to kind of drive away and let go a little bit. Okay, next slide. So there's a lot to navigate. We're going to keep talking about ways to navigate. Next slide. I apologize. I realize I'm going a little bit fast, but um, trying to finish up by 830. Uh, I know, you know, I know this has probably been a long stretch for you. Um, there's a lot of developmental challenges we expect during the college years. So at the beginning, uh, it's not unusual to be experiencing some homesickness or some adjustment to our culture for international students, even, even cultural adjustments around small town, big town. Sometimes we have students coming in from New York and Newark feels like a really small town. Sometimes we have students coming from small towns in Delaware and Newark feels like a big city. So lots of adjustments going on. They also have the challenge of trying to find their group and find their friends. If you think about it, prior to this, um, when they went off to middle school and high school, most of the time there were a lot of students they still knew. Now, it may be true for those in Delaware that you still know a good number of students here at UD, but um, this is probably the biggest transition they've had to make since they were in kindergarten, where they're feeling like most people I don't know, and how do I find the people that are going to be my friends? So, um, you know, I think one of the things you can do as parents is to remind them that it takes a little while to find your best friend. Some folks luck out and they love their roommate, but a lot of times people find a way to live with their roommate, but it might not be their best friend. And it can take a while to find people with whom you share interests, and who you have fun with. Um, and so it's really helpful if you can be that voice for them, that it's normal to, to, for that to take some time. Students also during these years, we expect them to be experimenting with, with relationships, trying to figure out who they're gonna love, what that's gonna be like. Um, we expect the academic demands to present new challenges. Um, Colleges and another opportunity to keep learning how to manage disappointments and manage expectations. They may have had some experience with that in high school. They will very likely have more experience with that in college. They're going to be working on their self-confidence and their self-esteem. Hopefully by the end of college, you're going to see a lot of growth in these, in these various areas. Um, there may be family transitions that come up. Um, of course, a big question is career questions. They may come in already very decided about what they're going to be. Maybe they're in engineering or nursing, or maybe they've wanted to be a veterinarian their whole life. Um, but what we've seen at the counseling center is sometimes when they get into the college level classes, they begin to realize that maybe the thing they thought they wanted isn't what they thought. And we are here, the Career Center are here to hold students when that's the case and to help them with those questions. From our perspective, we like it when an 18 year old can come in with a little bit of openness around their plans because they still have a lot of learning to do about the world of work, about the academic rigors in any particular field and about themselves, who they are, what they value, what they wanna do. So just know we're here to help if that those questions pop up. And then, of course, the Counseling Center um, is also here to help with stress and anxiety management. We are living in stressful times. I think all of us parents know that. Um, and our students, of course, feel that too. So uh, this is a time where we're hoping to really help them become more resilient and be able to bounce back when life gets hard. Okay, next slide. 
Will your student do as well in college as they did in high school? It's very possible they will. But one of the things I feel like I try to say to parents as a favor to the students is I really want to encourage you to be patient with the student in their first semester and their first year. We just talked about all the various developmental challenges that they're facing. So if you just take a pause and think about the fact that they are living away from home, usually for the first time, they're living on their own for the first time. For some students, they may be doing their laundry for the first time. They're going to have more free time than they've ever had before. And the classes are going to be more challenging by design. So the classes are going to have um, a bigger volume of work. They're going to have to read more, write more, and the expectations are going to be more rigorous. We're going to ask them to step up their game in terms of their synthesis of information and their level of analysis. So that's a lot. And then they've got to navigate how to manage a social life and school at the same time without possibly parents as an alarm clock or parents as a monitor of the work. So um, do expect that the grades may be a little lower than they were in high school initially, and then they may bounce back. Okay, next slide. So I touched on this a little bit, freedom versus responsibility. You will see these questions pop up. These are the questions that we expect that students are asking themselves. Who am I? What are my values? What am I interested in? How do I handle my emotions? Um, where am I going? What's the meaning of this work that I'm having to do? I'm having to work so hard. What am I going, am I going to use it? Um, and can I rely on myself and those around me? We're going to talk more in later slides about the importance of making that transition to asking for help. So part of growing up is being able to ask for help. We're going to talk about parents maybe stepping out of the role of being the expert, but then we want students to reach out to those of us on campus who are there to help support your student. We're kind of that in-between step, right, on the way to them becoming full adults. We're hoping to provide a lot of supports to them as they develop their ability to support themselves. Okay, next slide. So one of my favorite ways to talk about this kind of time is it's, it's sort of a liminal time. It's a threshold time. Your students have one foot in adulthood and one foot that's not quite in adulthood. Um, don't tell them I said that. Uh, but I think we all know that, right? Um, and so you're going to find that they give you a lot of mixed messages and it can feel confusing. There are going to be times when they tell you, I've got this. I don't need your input. Um, I'm making my own decisions, and then they land on your doorstep with a pile of their laundry, or they land on your doorstep and they ask for money, um, or, they, or they just love getting homemade chocolate chip cookies. Um, that's perfectly normal. This is a time, sometimes I, I like to think back to when they were two or three. If you remember that time when they're first learning to walk and they venture away from you, and they're really independent and they don't want your help, but then you watch them, they get a little far away and they look back to make sure you are still right there. They still need you, they still wanna know you're there. And that's gonna be true with this transition as well. They're gonna to wanna to know things aren't changing at home. Sometimes I suggest to parents to leave their bedroom at least for a semester, if you can stand it, leave their bedroom the same. You'd be surprised how much that means to them to come home and find at least something not changed because they're dealing with a whole lot of change all at once. Um, and one way I like to think about parents is you are their safe base. You know, confidence that you're there is part of what allows them to go out in the world and explore. So keep that in mind. Your job is to really... Uh, trust in their competence and then be there when they're vulnerable and come back and kind of need you to take care of them and hold them a little bit. Okay, next slide. This is just a funny one. I'll give you a minute to read it.
So hopefully you all have this experience of your students looking back at some point and appreciating how much knowledge and wisdom you have. It may not happen their freshman year in college or their sophomore year, but I, I think we all hope for the day when they, they realize we might know a thing or two. Okay. So part of what I'm trying to say here is that we really want to encourage parents to move from the role of expert who gives out the answers like the Oracle to consultant, empathic consultant. So we really want you um, to think about when students come to you and want help, um, not to be really quick to provide an answer. I have some funny stories about students who have called home, you know, one, one time years ago when students needed change for the uh, washer machines and the dryers, a student called home from Boston to someone on our staff and asked if he could mail quarters to them. And uh, he was wise enough um, to uh, help her learn that she could get change in Boston, that uh, he didn't need to mail her quarters. Or a student calls and says, I've lost my key. Um, you don't need to drive down from wherever you live and search the campus with them for their key. You could ask them a question like, um, well, who do you think you could call on campus that could help with that? Or where do you think you might be able to get another key? Um, so, so again, trying to develop their skills, their problem solving skills. And why do we want you to do this and make this shift? Because we want you to be able to retire from that role of providing all the answers. You know, my question to you is if not now, when? When else will you do this? So it's, it's hard, I get it that it's hard, it's hard to let go and the consequences get higher as they enter college. Um, they're higher than they were in high school. But our goal here is to grow them into competent adults who can go out into the world ready to manage things. And part of that is to, to help them figure things out. Okay, next slide. So part of how you do that is really encouraging the students to use the campus resources that are available. In this uh, prior panel, you heard from three of the offices that provide the well-being services. So the health center and wellness and health promotion and the counseling center. And then you also heard about the um, Office of Disability Studies. There's an academic enrichment center. There's a career center. RAs are there to support your student. So um, you can really help by reminding them of these resources. They're going to hear from all of us but they're gonna forget a lot of what we're saying. They're probably gonna get a little overwhelmed and probably a little full. Um, and you can, um, as I think Kelly mentioned earlier, you can be their memory um, and remind them of these resources. Um, encourage them to do problem solving. So instead of providing an answer, ask them questions that get them thinking about like what, what options have you considered? What are you thinking about? Um, how do you think that would work when they propose an option? Rather than saying that won't work, say, well, well, how do you think that would work out? So that they go through the thought process of thinking, well, maybe that won't work. Um, and remember, and this is, this is an anxiety management process for us, that mistakes are great teachers. It, you know, think about your own life and think about the ways that you've learned really amazing things when you've made mistakes. So sometimes allowing them to make mistakes is important. Okay, next slide. Uh, communication is super important. Um, I know I don't have much time, so I'm gonna try to speed it up a little bit. Um, one of the things we want you to think about talking to your student about is what are your expectations around communication? So um, when I was in college many moons ago, you kind of called home once a week and you did it from a pay phone, which just sounds funny now. And I know our students probably have never seen a pay phone, <laughs> um, but now they have a cell phone and um, they know how to use it and you know how to use it. So it's really helpful for you to be clear about what your expectations are. You know, some families want a daily call. Some parents want a weekly call. 
Um, some parents want a monthly call. <laughs> Whatever it is you expect, make sure they know about it. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think it's great to ask them what they're hoping for as well. Uh, my daughter, when she went off to college her freshman year, I said to her, I'm not going to call you. I'll, uh, I'll follow your lead. You call me when you need me and I'm here and I will, I will be here for you. And she said to me, why are you doing that? Why aren't you going to call me? You should just call me. And so that was the information I needed. I was so glad I had the conversation because clearly she wanted some calls, but that allowed me to kind of follow her, her cues and what she needed. And if you have needs, just make sure they know what those needs are. Um, and I always ask parents to consider how are you using the technology and how is it fostering the competence of your growing adult? You know, how is it helping that person grow in their ability to manage at least some things by themselves? We don't want people to become an island. We know we all need each other, but we also want to be careful that we're not fostering um, ongoing dependence or more dependence than we need to. Okay, next next slide. Um, this is just some tips about how to have productive conversations with your students. Um, sometimes I hear from students that when they call home, they get a lot of questions about how are your classes going? And they're really longing to hear just how are you? Because they have a lot going on in terms of classes, but they have a lot of other things going on too, socially and, um, you know, maybe they're involved in extracurriculars that they really care about. Maybe they're involved with a sport. Um, it's really nice to ask open-ended questions. And if they come to you with a problem, it's really helpful to be slow in, um, Encouraging them to tell you more about the problem instead of deciding really quickly that you've already got it and moving quickly to the solution. So I just want to encourage you to think about um, letting them talk and asking them questions. So how are you thinking about this? What what's the issue for you? What does this feel like to get as much information as you can? And then you might even ask them directly, how can I be helpful to you? Because sometimes we think they're calling because they want a specific answer. And sometimes they just want to be heard. They just want to feel validated. They just want to feel cared about. And they've already got some ideas about what they're going to do. They don't want advice sometimes. So ask what, what it is they want and how you can be helpful. Um, and help them think about the different options that they're considering. And if they're stuck, you can even call up the ways that they carry you inside of them. You can say things to them like, what would you imagine my advice would be? You'll be very pleased to know students, students can make very good guesses about what we would say. They know us pretty well after these 18 years of living. So, and they do carry us inside of them. They might fight our voice sometimes, but they can make pretty good guesses. So it's a great idea to see if they already know what you might advise. Um, and then try to be supportive with the idea that I think you've got this. You're going to be able to work this out. Um, okay, next slide. Um, I'm going to be quick on this one. Uh, student activities are really valuable. One of the things we know from research is that students that get really engaged with the campus and make the campus a community for themselves and get involved in activities tend to be happier. And that translates into actually doing better in your classes. So I know us parents can worry that our students will dive into too many activities and then not do well in classes. The research seems to say the opposite is true. Now, like everything in life, sometimes there's a balancing act to be had. Sometimes it's good to go slow in terms of your engagements, maybe that first semester while they get their feet under them in terms of how to manage the academic load, you know, how they work all those learning curves they've got going on. But ultimately, the goal is really to help them get involved. And that is part of how they meet their friends and how they meet people who are similar to them. And there is going to be an information fair in the fall that's a really wonderful thing for them to go to because they'll meet other students who are involved with maybe 300 different organizations. 
So if you can, try to encourage your student to take advantage of those sorts of things. And you see there's also a website where they can get more information. Okay, next slide. Um, your student's mental health. Uh, so we're starting to talk about this more than we used to in this program because um, students are arriving on campus with mental health needs that have already been identified and maybe even the process of addressing it has begun. Maybe they've had therapy at home. Maybe they've had, um, maybe they've even had a hospitalization. Maybe they're on medication. So we really encourage you to talk about stress, to talk about um, mental health with your student, but also with us. Um, so I do encourage you to reach out to the Counseling Center if you want to figure out a plan for your students' mental health while they're on campus. That plan might include our services or it might include off-campus resources. The Counseling Center is really aware of off-campus resources and we have a search engine to help with that process so we can help your students find better fits off campus if that's a good option. But we also run wonderful groups. We provide short-term therapy. We provide single session options. So we have a lot of things that we also provide in-house. Um, and, and do think about talking with your students about the importance of sleep, good nutrition, taking medication regularly, social life and academics. It's a balancing act. But but you have to have that foundation. Health is built on the foundation of the basics. And uh, sleep and good diet are super important. So try to put in a plug for that. These are things that often get a little bit sacrificed during the college years. So, um, so I just want to put in a plug for that. Okay, next slide. Um, another thing we always like to say to parents, especially those who are out of state, Check on your insurance coverage. Make sure that your insurance will cover your student when they are in Newark, Delaware. You know, coverage that only um, will cover providers in New York or New Jersey or Maryland isn't very helpful to your student. And you can advocate with your insurance company for them to provide resources for your student in the Newark area while your student is here for these four years. I think it's a great idea to do that advocacy before you're in a situation where the student needs it. So think about doing that um, soon. Think about doing that over the summer. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, make a plan with your student if they have pre-existing uh, mental health concerns. Make sure they have enough medicine Make sure that they're connected to a therapist. Um, talk about an emergency plan. If an emergency happens, how they can reach you. Um, and if they've had disability support in the past or they want that in college, make sure they register for the disability support services. In my experience, we have a lot of students who land on our doorstep who came into college not wanting to need those services. And so they didn't register, even though in the past they had used them. Um, let your student know that registering for those services doesn't mean, mean that they have to use those accommodations, but if they need them, they can um, they have them. So it's, it's better to have them in place just in case. Um, next slide. Um, all right, I'm going to try to be really quick here. Um, uh, they come home. They come back home at break times. The first time they'll probably do that will be at Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving is um, a whole week. So um, you start out the week being very happy they're home. You probably uh, cook their favorite meals. So you do their laundry. You're so happy to see them. You let them sleep, you know, as much as they want. And then it wears a little thin by the end of the week and you realize um, that you want them to help out around the house or you want um, them to help out with meals or you want to reinstitute a curfew, make sure you have those conversations with them. And the earlier you have them, the better. Okay, next slide. Uh, when they come to visit, the big tip here is call ahead. Don't surprise them. If you come and surprise them, you may be surprised as well. Their, their room probably won't live, look as neat as it used to look. Um, 
and come prepared to pamper them. They'd love it if you brought some home cooked meals. They'd love it if you took them and the roommate out to dinner. Um, you know, they're definitely not going to turn that down. Okay, next slide. Um, this, I think, is near the last slide, so I'm just going to say quickly that this is a transition for you parents as well. Um, you know, I often think there's a little bit of midlife stuff that can come up for us parents um, around what are we going to do now that our students are launched. Um, even if this isn't your, your last, it's still going to start the thought process, I think, about what am I going to do when my kids are independent and don't need me in the same way. And there can be a way you can embrace this time as an exciting time to figure out, you know, what, what do you want to do with all the energy and time that your student took up for so many years? They're still going to need you, but you will probably have some energy left over once they're out of the house. And just be prepared. You will probably feel sad and miss them, and so will their siblings. So that's just something good to think about. Okay, next slide. I think we're just gonna start talking about resources. Yeah, so this is a good site. Set, Setthego.org is a good site. Um, and then the next slide is just some books. And I'm gonna end it there because I know that it, I've gone over and it's time to move on. So thank you, best of luck with this transition. Thank you so much, Marianne. We really appreciate it. Um, I love that session. And every time I still find myself giggling and laughing at uh, a lot of the, the jokes that you all weave in there um, and that it's just really heartwarming that, um, yeah, we're able to provide this, uh, this session for parents to help guide them through this transitional moment. Um, so, all right, that is all that we have time for today. Um, and it looks like the Q and A died down. Thank you so much for your thoughtful questions. This isn't the last time that you're going to have our opportunity to interact with us. Um, so please, uh, feel free to contact us, um, either through the phone numbers that you see on the screen or through our website. Uh, and then I'm also just dropping an evaluation form on the chat. Um, it's just, three multiple choice questions and two open-ended questions. We'd really love to hear your feedback so we can continually improve this. Um, and I will hand it back over to our um, new student orientation folks to take it from here. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much, Helen Ann. It was a great session, super informative. So for everyone here today, we have one more session left for you. Um, if you could join me in welcoming the rest of our student um, orientation leaders, as well as Connor and our wonderful intern for our student Q&A panel. All right, good evening, everyone. Hope you've all been having a wonderful program so far. Uh, my name is Cole Guidry, and I am a graduate intern with orientation and transition programs for the summer, and I will be moderating our Q&A panel for the evening. So like Sunit said, we are joined by a few of our student leaders this evening. Um, you met Connor and Sunit earlier, but I will go ahead and let two of our orientation leaders introduce themselves, uh, starting with Vanessa. Hi everyone, welcome to this session. My name is Vanessa Vaughn. I am a sophomore interpersonal communications major with a minor in human development and family science. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Maya Walker. I am a senior wildlife ecology and conservation major with a minor in English. I'm from Los Angeles, California, and I use any pronouns. Great, thank you both. So we will go ahead and jump right into our Q&A. Um, feel free to use the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen as you have been doing throughout the program and submit any questions that you would like our student leaders to answer. Um, we will go ahead and get started with one that I have pulled up. So what is one question that, or one tip that you would have for students um, preparing this summer to enter their first year? No, you got it, Vanessa. <laughs> Okay, I was just going to say one thing for students is really just getting ready for a big change. I honestly was not really ready for it, and I really should have prepared myself more. I really think that um, just kind of knowing that you're probably not going to be living alone in your room anymore, you're, you're going to probably have to share with someone. But also, like was it was mentioned earlier in a different presentation that there's going to be a lot more free time for students, and sometimes 
um, students might take advantage of the free time and kind of just like not do anything during the free time. And I did that a lot during my, during my first semester and kind of didn't really focus on what I should have been focusing on. So um, just knowing that the free time is there for um, future success. So that could be like just studying, getting your work done in advance, um, stuff like that, definitely. Yeah, I would um, tell all students or for you to tell your students, don't be afraid to just kind of talk to the people next to you. Don't be afraid to say hi. Um, my tip is to, my little trick is to always have a compliment ready for someone. Even if you're saying you like their shirt and you don't really like their shirt, it's a great compliment. It's a great conversation starter. Um, and it's a great way to break the ice, but really just talking to the people around you, getting to know them. It's a great way to network, make connections, but also find your friends here on campus. Yeah, and going off of that, I wish that I had known that everyone there is just trying to make friends because I didn't know that. And I was like, everyone here has already found their people and everyone was struggling the same way that I was. So just making sure your students know that talking to people like Sunit said is a great way to stay connected with the community. Awesome, thank you all. Um, so something you all kind of touched on was finding your community played a big part in your transition. How did you go about finding your community and getting involved on campus? Well, I think one of the ways that I really met some really great friends was through our registered student organizations or our, our on-campus clubs. And I don't know if we've mentioned it before, but we, during our welcome week programming, we have something called the involvement fair. So basically what it is, it's your classic college club fair. So we have a bunch of tables from each of our student organizations where there will be representatives from those clubs and there'll also be like sign up sheets. So I signed up for a bunch of different of our RSOs and I got on a bunch of email lists and I just started going to meetings, seeing what I kind of want to get involved in. And that's why I met a lot of people who I am still friends with today. So to me, I think clubs are a really great way of putting yourself out there. You don't even have to like continue engaging in the club, but it's just a great way to kind of meet people who are like minded. So that was very helpful for me. Great, thank you, Connor. Um, so how accessible is campus as far as like getting around and transportation and such? I would say campus is very accessible to um, most students, all students on campus. Um, for example, there are students in wheelchairs um, and have um, other physical disabilities. And um, there are ramps all over campus um, to like most um, buildings to get into. There's ramps like into the student centers as well. Um, what like anywhere where there's steps, usually there is a ramp to get up. Um, there's also elevators in a lot of these buildings as well. And then um, if a student has any other sort of physical um, physical disability, there's also a way you can get accommodations for that through um, DSS. So like students can contact. Um, disability support services if they are in a wheelchair or do have like a broken leg or something and need some extra assistance and they can also have that be an accommodation for their living um, centers like if like residence halls for example so if um, a student is in a wheelchair and they can't get upstairs um, they will typically be placed in like a place in a residence hall that has an elevator um, just so it's more accessible for them um, there's also uh, shuttles like UD shuttles that um, students can contact so they can get from um, classes or to wherever they need to be um, on time, which is also very helpful as well. Awesome. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, I, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but there is the double map app to um, track those shuttles as well. So it shows live locations as well as all the bus stop locations. Um, so that's a really good resource for students to use also. Um, so where do you tend to study on campus and spend most of your like downtime when you're here? I spend all of my time in Morris Library, which we call Club Morris. Um, I spend most of my weekends there. There's three different, well, there's four different floors, um, but the lowest floor is more for like multimedia. You can check out cameras um, and just equipment for media classes or fun. Um, but there's rooms that you can reserve. So if I need to work on a group project or study with friends, I reserve space in Morris Library. Or if I just want to like hang out and read a book in between the aisles, I go there. Um, ICE, which is our um, engineering lab, is um, on East Campus. And that's also a great 
place to study I found. Great, thank you, Maya. Um, so we have a question here. Are there any policies on what a student can bring to the residence halls, such as microwaves, fridges, and so on? Yeah, so there are some limitations with things like that. Um, for every room is only allowed to have one microwave and one fridge. So once you get your roommate assignments, which should be coming out either at the end of this month or early August, you should your student should coordinate um, with their roommate to discuss you know who's bringing what. If you go about the renting route, um, whatever that may be, kind of talking about that. And obviously, you know, there's the um, kind of stereotypical rules, so like you no know, candles, things like that, just to uh, promote safety and make sure, you know, everyone's safe while in their residence hall. Great, and I'll kind of continue off of um, that since we're on the topic of uh, living on campus. Are there any suggested items that from your personal experience you would suggest students bring? Um, sorry. Okay, I say this all the time, and I just love repeating this always because parents and families are always so shocked by this, but it's usually a vacuum. Um, and I'm like, for me, like, I just have a lot of hair, so I see a lot of hair everywhere. Like, that's just how it is for me. But also, like, sometimes if you, like, drop a cookie or, like, something on the floor, like something will end up on the floor and you're, you're, you might like end up having an issue with that. So just having a vacuum is just very, very helpful. It's been helpful for me. It's been helpful for a lot of people that I know. Um, having that is very nice. Um, yeah. And I'll say, if you want something to vacuum, bring a rug. Um, but no, actually, rugs are very helpful because um, Sunit always says this, but like when you wake up at like 7.30 for your 8 a.m. class, you don't want to put your feet on the cold floor. It's just very jarring. And I think rugs, not only very helpful and very comforting, but it also makes the room feel a little homier. So it's always nice to come back to a space that feels like it's your home and it's lived in. And it's not just like a cold, white, blank room. So rugs are definitely something that I didn't think of. And until a little bit into my first semester. So I definitely recommend that. Awesome, thank you both. That isn't something I would have thought of either. So I appreciate that tip too. Um, so let's transition to parking. Is parking fairly accessible on campus? How has your experience been with that? Yeah, so I can talk about parking. Um, I, I feel like I'm the parking whiz at this point. Um, so yes, parking on campus is split up between different lots that kind of vary in location. So we have red lots, which are on the north and south end of campus, um, gray lots, which are more centralized. And we also have parking garages, which is also centralized. Um, those prices kind of vary depending on how close you get to campus. And obviously um, having, um, parking garages at the, like, at the most expensive, just because um, there's kind of, a, a, you have to pay for the covered parking kind of thing. So um, parking is super accessible. First year students can have their car on campus, but um, obviously it isn't necessary. One, we're a super walkable campus. There's the amazing shuttle system that Vanessa was talking about earlier. And we're also um, kind of lucky because we're super close to a lot of major cities. So if your student you know, wants to spend a weekend in Philly or maybe take a day trip to New York, that's possible. Um, we have an Amtrak station right between Central and South Campus as well as um, SEPTA stops and then the DART, which is the like Delaware bus system, can take them all around the Delaware area. So cars aren't necessary, but um, they are there if they need them, and it's super accessible to have your car. Great. Thank you, Sunit. Um, so is there a gym that is available to students on campus? And where is that located? And it's three in one. Is there a fee included to use the gym? So there is a recreation fee that is kind of included in some of those additional costs with tuition. So it's automatically charged to full-time students. Um, the exact breakdown, I'm not 100% sure of like how much it costs. Um, one of my other OLs, if you know, you could um, add on there, but it will be kind of listed in your financial services when you pay um, to be like a student. Uh, but once you pay, you just bring your ID and you can scan into the gym. So the gym is located on like the north edge of central campus. So it's very accessible, um, very close walk to a lot of the residence halls. And it's really great. They have a lot of facilities there, a lot of um, 
equipment, um, weights, they have a rock wall, a swimming pool, a bunch of different um, gyms, basketball courts. So a lot of options for students, which is great. I also just wanted to say there's also smaller satellite gyms located in some of the residence halls. So one on East Campus in um, Harrington Hall and then um, another one on Laird Campus, which is um, in Independence. So if your student doesn't feel like walking a further distance, they can always just go into a closer one on their side of campus. Awesome, thanks uh, Connor and Vanessa. Um, so we talked a bit about 1743 welcome days earlier. Could you, could any of you go into a bit of detail about like what kind of activities and events go on during that weekend and what that experience is like? So it's a lot of social programming that's meant to introduce your student to UD, but also their floor. So what mine looked like was like my uh, my freshman floor would go around with our RA and they would um, like do icebreakers so we would get to know each other. Um, we did game day 101, which is basically like an introduction to how to cheer for your sports team here. Um, there's a football game that happens. Um, there's also um, the involvement fair. And that's where you can get to know some of your registered student organizations. Um, so on Academy Street, that's going to get shut down. And then all of the RSOs are going to be lined up and your student can just walk down and meet clubs, write their email down, and then they'll probably join like 30 clubs and never go to a single meeting, but stay on their email list for all four years, which I definitely did. Um, there's also puppies on the green, which is really fun. And there's also the Twilight Induction Ceremony, which is this little ritual where uh, President Asanas comes and speaks and makes us official blue hens as we all light candles and pass the flame down to one another. It's very fun. Awesome. Thanks, Maya. Um, so it looks like we've caught up on all of our questions. I'm just going to throw one question in here briefly. Um, what has been all of your favorite parts about your experience at UD so far? I think my favorite part of UD is how easy it is to get involved in extracurriculars, more specifically anything involving like internships and jobs. So UD makes it really easy to find internships and jobs. They also have so many opportunities, which was part of the reasons why I came here. So I don't know, I just really love that I feel like I can be fulfilled, make a little bit of extra money. And also when it comes to academics, you know, get a little research opportunity to help to kind of enhance your experience. So I think UD is really great at providing those opportunities to students. Um, kind of similar to what Connor was saying, but I feel like my favorite thing is the constant support that I feel when I'm here. Um, not only, you know, through the friends that I've made, but also academically, um, I feel like I've been able to connect to resources that really help me. And, you know, it's something that's kind of there and um, I don't really have to go searching for it, which I really like because it takes a lot of the burden of getting help off of my shoulders. Um, but also like, um, you know, being a person of color at a university. Um, it's a very difficult process, but I feel like UD makes it known and really tries hard um, and succeeds in making this a really safe and welcoming environment for all. Um, for me, my favorite part was really just getting to know my floor my first year. Um, I've like made like the greatest friends from my first, like my first year floor. I was in a triple. And um, so I got to know like a ton more people um, because of that. Um, my neighbors were like my absolute best friends. Um, just like meeting the people, I kept my door open like all the time. So people would just come by. It was just so fun to like see people just, even if I didn't even know them that well, they would just say hi through my door. Um, so that was really, really fun. And just like, like I said, getting to know the people in my classes, I didn't, I would like make friends with just like the person sitting next to me. So it was just helpful to have that. And I just really enjoyed that. Made me, made me feel like I was home. I mean, similar to Sinead, my favorite part here is just the people, um, especially the academics, um, the professors in my major, I switched my major after my first year and they made me feel so welcome. Um, they're very open to me just going into their offices and like talking to them very casually, um, which I appreciate that. I love that sort of rapport and having like personal connections with my uh, 
advisors and professors um, and just like learning what I love is amazing. So it's all thanks to UD. Great, those are some great um, examples. Thank you all for sharing. Um, so I think that will round out our time with the Q&A panel. So thank you to all of our students who uh, participated in our panel and thank you to all of our guests who submitted some great questions this evening. Um, so this will wrap up the end of our program. I hope you've all gotten some great information from tonight um, and really are getting prepared to transition your students to their time here at University of Delaware. Um, I do have a couple of announcements before you before you go. There will be some optional um, virtual sessions to attend throughout the summer um, on various topics like living on campus, student financial services, study abroad. There's all kinds of them going on for the rest of the summer. Um, you can find information about these on the Blue Hen Family Hub. So if you have not joined that yet, make sure you create your account so you can view all the information that is being posted there. Um, your student can also access these sessions through their new student orientation campus page. So they can see them on that, their calendar as well. Um, but with that, that is all we have for you this evening. I hope you all have a great rest of your summer and we will see you at 1743 Welcome Days. Have a great night.